we can't hear you clearly but it is not from my is it from my yes sir because uh, it's showing two devices i will what i'll do sir i'll remove in one of them now yeah. one i'll remove i'll remove yes sir it's removed sir now you speak sir can i confirm that okay yes sir very clear now? yes sir yes sir okay please okay. proceed so, sir so so oh, sorry for the inconvenience no, no problem now we'll straight away go for uh, lecture so my topic you know i have given understanding the courtship behavior and the mass breeding of the f flies pelagic aps of course uh, it's not my intention to talk only on uh, pelagic aps or a butterfly but here you know i would like to emphasize on uh, the how basic uh, science or understanding the behavior of any organism is very important even for uh, understanding any type of research even for conservation or for our protection or for mass breeding so for any research you know the basic science is very important so in this connection you know i will be talking about uh, insects and their behavior and uh, in this you know why insects are highly successful on this planet because you know in this biodiversity about 70 to 80% are from insect population the insects are highly abundant and dominant uh, because they have well developed communication system so their communication is through by vision touch sound or odors the odor means you know they use uh, uh, maybe external or maybe they using their own uh, chemicals that is called as semio chemicals or pheromones but in insects we could see both instinct and uh, instinct and learnt behavior the instinct is uh, inherited uh, we can see commonly the several behavior what we see in insects uh, most of them are uh, you know inherited but apart from that learnt behavior is also there like uh, habituation associative learning or uh, latent learning but the behavior you know has been very well studied in some groups of insects especially social insects like honey bees termites ants and wasp and uh, in this the behavior modifying chemicals that is known as uh, semio chemicals what insects use in communication which are useful in reproduction foraging and uh, defense so that's why with all these insects you know are, are uh, highly successful and highly abundant and dominant because of well developed communication system apart from that in insect behavior the plant secondary metabolites so wherever uh, phytophagous insects are there insects which feed, feed on plants the plant secondary metabolites also plays a very important role so we have uh, you know uh, insects like very important insects like pollinators uh yeah, several insects including honey bees and productive insects again honey bees or silkworm or lac insects and then we have natural enemies natural enemies like uh, predators or parasites from insect groups may be on other insects and similarly many insects or detritive hosts they play a very important role in natural habitat however several millions of insects are there they are highly dominant and abundant in biodiversity about 70 to 80% a few insects are vectors and pests of crops so whenever uh, the insects are vectors or pests of crops we have to manage them you know to manage the vectors uh, and pests we have to understand their behavior primarily so apart from this understanding the behavior of insect natural enemies for example uh, insect predators or insect parasites is also very important to use them as biological control agents in pest management you can see here the various uh, types of diversity of uh, insects very fascinating groups you can see the honey bees or praying mantis or a beetle or a predator here by control agent it can be used as a by control agent or it's a natural enemy feeding on the plant bugs and we can see the plant sucking bugs here we can see the moths 
and uh, a pest hairy caterpillars or wasps or uh, moths or a uh, jewel beetles so very few examples to show how insects population are highly diverse so insects uh, highly evolved because they evolved you know during paleozoic era in the devonian period uh, you know the insects evolved uh, between 400 million years ago so they have a very vast experience and whereas man has evolved about 2 million years ago but insects evolved as early as 400 million years ago and they have uh, highly evolved and you know they are uh, they, that's why in most of the time they are highly successful uh, in this nature on this planet so you can see the biodiversity of our world scenario the total you know the estimated the plants and all animals put together is about 13 12 to 13 million species out of which you can see insects accounts for about 8 to 9 million you know uh, species of insects so they are highly abundant in our biodiversity and that's why the insects population is highly rich and abundant out of uh, this you know we have identified only you know just uh, 1.5 to 1.8 million uh, species and in uh, indian scenario you can see the insect uh, biodiversity so the insect population earlier you know we thought about uh, 1 million species but now predicted number is about uh, sorry the 14 lakh and identified species is about uh, 60000 and uh, yet to be identified or uh, numerous so about uh, 6 lakhs we can see this is the rough estimation so the coming to the insect biodiversity they are highly abundant even in uh, insects groups the some groups like uh, coleoptera beetles the butterflies that is lepidoptera moths and butterflies and then hymenoptera bees and wasps uh, ants and uh, the mosquitoes you know the flies and mosquitoes comes under diptera they are uh, you know the highly abundant and even uh, bugs several hemipteran bugs are also abundant and other insects contribute you know about 70% and another group is spider mites ticks so arachnids so that's why insects are uh, very highly you know uh, abundant and uh, highly you know successful on this planet planet so now have you thanked insect today why we should uh, thank insects so you know the large number of plant species depend on insects for pollination and reproduction the insects enrich soil hence plants are benefited because most of the insects are detritivores uh, most of the insects you know always useful and the soil builders and without insects land would be covered with only wind pollinated plants with clumps of small trees and bushes here and there there will be no evergreen forests or deciduous forests or uh, you know the thick forests so that's why the billions of insects you know have been in charge of this world from about 400 million years ago so that's why the insects are uh, very important uh, in our uh, a planet and they contribute lot in our ecosystem so coming to the the behavior so the insects are uh, you know some behavior uh, for example i told the uh, instinct or uh, learned behavior the instinct okay it is inherited from uh, species to species from parents to offsprings uh, but the learned behavior is based on their experience in a particular habitat for example uh, latent learning most of you have uh, uh, known the spatial memory studied uh, you know in digger was by tin bergen for which he was given nobel prize so you can see here this is a digger wasp the digger wasp make a small burrow in a loose sand and then you know they make a burrow and then they deposit their egg inside and come out and then you know they go for bringing the prey because when egg hatches inside the larva require a food so they go 
you know after laying the egg in the burrow they come out and go in search of their prey they always sting or paralyze the bee the honey bees wherever available and bring the honey bees and uh, kept them inside the you know the ticker in the nest and then close the nest so once uh, egg hatches they will feed on this honey bee you know the larvae will hatch they feed on this honey bee and then they develop and then ticker wasp will emerge from this from this nest but the tin virgin you know astonished whether uh, how do they remember the nesting site when they go out they have to come back to the same nesting site how do they remember so when they were uh, digger was digging the nest you know he placed the uh, um, pine cone around the nest and when it came out it has you know the pine cones were present and it has gone out for bringing the prey so when it has gone out for bringing the prey he has removed the pine cone and kept it in a different place and then watching and then when it has come back with a prey because this uh, digger wasp uh, sting the prey on their neck and then paralyze and uh, bring it back and enter the nest and keep it there and close the nest so that the hatched out larvae from its egg will feed on this honey bee develop and then you know the adult uh, digger wasp will come out so when they when it had came back you know instead of going to its nest it was searching the pine cone and it was uh, thinking that the nest is here because when it has come out it has observed the surroundings here uh, what are the objects are here it remember not only the objects here around the nest it also remember the root so it will go to several uh, uh, meters away and then it has to come back so this you know the latent learning so whenever it learn it will have immediately no reward for it is hidden or latent within animals there is no immediate reward but uh, during acquiring the knowledge it, it had no apparent value but it will be used later to keep its prey so this shows that of course this is not permanent uh, it is a temporary behavior once it is learnt you know for a particular purpose it will serve the purpose so that it can successfully complete its uh, generation complete its successfully you know it can breed so this uh, type of behavior what we could see in higher animals we can also see in uh, insects it's a very lower group so that's why you know then you know tin virgin uh, thought it may be based on the scent it may be may not based on the sight so i told you know communication is uh, by sound or sight or vision or odor so that's why this is the earlier uh, trial you can see here the pine cone in the nest and it is coming out and it uh, pine cone is replaced and it will go to the pine cone not to the original nest because it is uh, remembering the surroundings based on that but in the second experiment he has kept you know some scented uh, plates there uh, in the uh, different plates and uh, two scented plates and then when it has gone out for uh, bringing the prey he has removed the scented uh, plates and kept it in a different place and he removed another you know unscented plates here but the digger wasp instead of going to the scented plates it has come to this original place of this marking you know the particular marking searching for its nest but original nest is here but it is searching here because when it has gone outside this was the situation around its nest these cones or markings were there but when when it has come out because it remember what are the objects are there around its nest that is remembered and then you know it will go in search of nest around this markings so this clearly shows that you know the behavior and the latent uh, behavior uh, you know is uh, well registered in insects and then we can see you know the, this is uh, what we could see in our uh, bangalore university campus a digger wasp you know uh, digging the nest here uh, going inside and then it deposited eggs and then it came uh, the coming out and uh, closed the burrow and gone out for uh, in search of prey and now it has come out 
to the same nest, you can see a small bug under its uh, abdomen. It is a paralyzed prey. It will keep inside and then, you know, come out and then close the burrow and it will uh, leave the burrow there. So then, you know, these, uh, the hatched out uh, larva uh, from the egg will feed on the inside the spray and then develop and complete its uh, development. So this is a very beautiful example how insects also have a learned behavior like latent learning. And uh, this we can see even in, uh, you know, the spatial memory in water wasp inside your house, it may come and uh, start uh, constructing a nest on uh, the chair table or on the chair side of the chair and maybe on some objects immediately, you know, they, each nest, uh, small nest, they will uh, uh, construct and then deposit one egg and go and bring the caterpillar, paralyzed caterpillar, keep it inside and uh, close the nest and one more nest will be uh, constructed here. Here, you know, several nests will be there. It looks like one nest, but uh, several uh, eggs will be kept. And uh, the students, you know, can see if you replace the chair or table to the another place, it will come to the original place and search for its nest. So our youngsters can try and see whether we can see this type of latent behavior even in uh, pot or wasp, even inside your house. So this is how, you know, the insect shows a marvelous uh, learning behavior uh, in their daily activities. So apart from that, you know, the behavior is well studied in honeybees by Carl von Frisch. Uh, there, you know, uh, he was given Nobel Prize and very famous examples is the round dance and waggle dance. Of course, this the dance, you know, may be inherited, but the particular other, uh, you know, the matter associated foraging activity associated with the dance is a learned behavior. Of course, even for uh, learned behavior, there should be a built-in predisposition or uh, genetic foundation should be there. You can see here, though this behavior is uh, inherited, but some behavior, you know, they have learning abilities. You can see the associative learning and also the latent uh, learning behavior in honeybees. The honeybees, you know, when they go for foraging, they associate fragrance of the flower and nectar load a particular fragrance and which yield the highest nectar load they visit and also the color and nectar load, the color of the flower and the nectar load they remember, they associate and remember and the time and the nectar load. So based on the sun movement, the timing they calculate and which time the highest nectar is, uh, you know, yielding, then only they go and collect the nectar. So many factors very judiciously they manage and not only that, Apart from this associative learning, they also have spatial learning or latent learning like a sun position, nectar source, and then back to their nest. If sun is not there because of overcast, then polarized light they use, and then they go for nectar source, collect the nectar, and come back to the nest. They will not miss the route, or they will not enter the different nest. And similarly, the sky is, com uh, sky is completely overcast and there is no sun or polarized light. Then they depend on landmarks like, you know, the trees or buildings or uh, mountains or some objects. They remember like digger wasp and then, you know, they collect the nectar and come back. So this shows that it is not higher organisms or human beings. Even in uh, insects, the lower group, they have a very well-developed uh, learned behavior. That's why they very meticulously, they, uh, you know, uh, uh, interact and very meticulously, you know, always uh, complete their work or, uh, you know, whatever may be their uh, foraging or reproduction or maybe colony defense. So all this, you know, depending upon the changing environment, they learn and uh, they're successful in their uh, colony, uh, you know, breeding. So apart from this, we also, we could see the camouflage. The insects, you know, the, to escape from the predator or to from the, catch the predator. In, in this case, most of the time to escape from the predator, you can see the spindic larvae. You know, most of the time you can see it's a midrib and the veins. And also these are the, 
you know the lemon butterfly or common j pupa they deposit you know they the, the pupate here on the plant there you know it looks like a small leaf so that's how you know they can escape from the predators like lizards or birds you can see here hairy, hairy caterpillars they almost you know merge with the background of the stem and similarly this is the common barren uh, butterfly very common on uh, uh, mango leaves this is the caterpillar you can see very well adjusted on the midrib and its uh, hairs you know looks like a, a veins so from this you know camouflage always they escape from the predators and sometime to catch the predators they can also use this camouflage for example you can see here this praying mantis uh, here uh, you, you it looks like a small stick so it will uh, always sit here and wait for the prey so similarly we can see here one small praying mantis on the bark i know it is almost merged and this is the uning brown butterfly in the litter we cannot uh, make out them and these are the beautiful behavior they exhibit and then you know they uh, escape from the predators or they may catch the predators that's why they are highly successful and i also told the plant the secondary metabolites plays a very important role in uh, insects life for example the milkweed uh, aposematic or warning coloration you see the milkweed the calotropis gigantea and the calotropis uh, you know the procera asclepidaceae this milkweed plants always you know store cardiac and cyanogenic glycosides and toxic alkaloids in them so that you know most of the insects cannot come and feed on these plants only the few you know the specialist insects the specialist insects like painted grasshoppers or plain tiger larva these larva or uh, this uh, you know the nymphs of this um, painted grasshoppers hoppers can feed on the leaves of milkweed plant and can they sequester and store sequester means they convert this uh, cardiac and cyanogenic glycosides uh, and non toxic alkaloids um, and then store them in their body so why they have to store all suppose Uh, many other insects come and feed on these calotropis uh, leaves it will affect these you know the cardiac and cyanogenic uh, glycosides and alkaloids affect and hinder the growth and uh, those insects cannot develop and complete their development only a few insects can you know overcome this problem and they can dealt with these uh, glycosides and toxic alkaloids and uh, use them for their benefit so these insects uh, store them even in the larval form or in the adult form uh, these uh, glycosides and alkaloids and when the pre predators like uh, lizards or uh, birds will uh, feed on them immediately they get heart attack because these uh, cardiac and cyanogenic glycosides increase the cardiac rate and they get heart attack so that you know they will avoid feeding on this so this is not sufficient here in this uh, evolution of behavior they also become highly colorful when they are non palatable they should become uh, colorful very brightly colorful so that they can educate the predators easily about their non palatable condition so to educate the predators they become very bright so that you know the predators will learn this brightly colored or non palatable bitter otherwise you know if they are not educated properly the predators the lizards or birds may attack them and then after attacking they will come to know that they are bitter so that they will not get food at that time at the same time these insects are also injured and uh, dead so both are not benefited so both organisms are not benefited both the, the predator and prey and this behavior is not you know Uh, accepted in the natural selection that's why this behavior is known as spite so the both are, that's why to avoid this to educate the predators they brightly colored so that you know the educate the predators will come to know that they are bitter and they are unpalatable similarly but one more uh, beautiful example here is the another uh, dangid egg fly that is uh, you know the hypolimnus miscipus 
this is not feeding on the milkweed plant and this is not storing this uh, glycosides or alkaloids in them but they mimic the model like uh, danius chrysippus that is a plain tiger and escape from the predator so these are all some of the beautiful examples or uh, even in insects plant interactions how we know the behavior plays a very important role here so next uh, you know i will be talking about the management when some insects are uh, pests or vectors they are injurious so uh, they are nuisance you have to manage them so for example copy waste timber copy waste timber it's a beetle the xylotricus quadripes so to manage them you have to understand their behavior unless we know their behavior the management is not possible so these beetles always you know the male and female a coleopteran cerambicid beetle a small beetle about 1 inch length these beetles will active and mate only under bright sunlight and they deposit eggs in the cracks and crevices of the bark of the copy stem so that to uh, minimize the pest attack in the copy estate they have to maintain the shade trees so that you know sunlight will be reduced the mating will be reduced so that they will not mate females are not fertilized and then they cannot lay the fertilized eggs that is the one thing the second thing their behavior they deposit their eggs female will deposit their gravid uh, fertilized eggs in the cracks and crevices of the bark of the main stem and trick primaries suppose we remove the dead bark they will not uh, deposit their eggs so that you know they can be controlled and copy plants should be protected apart from this you know these insects the male will secrete a pheromone and attracts the female for mating but in this case when male you know secretes the pheromone sometimes it attract both male and female this is known as aggregation pheromone and these pheromones can be used in the management of this pest and even in this pheromone we have to develop a trap depending upon species specific trap depending upon the behavior of the insects we have several pheromone traps depending upon the groups of insects for example beetles or moths or flies so different groups and there you know the flight activity and there depending upon their activity we develop you know the particular types of traps so that's why you know the understanding the behavior of uh, any insects the insect pests or vectors is very important in the management so next uh, very important uh, uh, you know the work i will be talking on the carnivorous butterfly spelgis aps so you know the butterflies lepidoptera the butterflies and moths comes under the group you know order lepidoptera so the moths you know about uh, uh, more than 140000 and then butterflies are very less about 18000 species of butterflies are there in india we have about 1500 species and world you know uh, 18000 species in which butterflies most of the butterflies are phytophagous but the very few are carnivorous butterfly they are non vegetarian they feed on uh, you know uh, other insects or other uh, you know organisms here the ape fly ape means you know the pupa of this fly it looks like a monkey that's why it is called as ape fly in india this is the very important carnivorous butterfly we have the most of the butterflies you think they are feeding on the plants and uh, the larvae of the butterflies feed on the plants and then they develop they are called as phytophagous butterfly but we have a very important one species in india this is the carnivorous vorus butterfly spelgis aps lycanidae so this butterfly is a very small butterfly you can see you know the length 10 to 11 mm and this butterfly deposit their eggs in the mealy bugs the mealy bugs are nothing but the plant sucking uh, pests like you know our uh, head louse uh, uh, suck our uh, uh, blood from the head uh, similarly these uh, uh, plant lice or mealy bugs suck the sap of the plants from the leaves or stem 
So these eggs will hatch, and these are the butterfly larva. Looks like a slug. So you may not believe this. This is a caterpillar. This is the caterpillar of this butterfly. They feed on these mealybugs, and then you know they pupate, and pupa is like a egg fly. Very beautiful. Looks like a monkey face. That's why it is called as egg fly. And then you know this is the larva. You can see here larva of the caterpillar of the butterfly feeding on the. mealybugs here you can see whole population of the mealybugs are completely devoured it's a very potential predator on mealybugs so next we can see here several species of mealybugs are very important pests on economically important crops like uh, coffee cocoa grapes mango mulberry and vegetables these mealybugs cannot be controlled using by insecticides because they are covered by you know the wax coating the waxy coating this wax coating will not allow insecticides to establish insecticides to establish the contact and they that's why insecticides are not useful in the management of mealybugs these mealybugs attack the several species of plants and suck the sap and debilitate the plants so that's why indian government has imported two exotic uh, you know the biocontrol agents one is predator that is a cryptolemus montrosera it's a beetle another one is a wasp leptomastix dactylope from other countries and then you know we mass multiply them in the laboratory and release them in the field but however we have our own uh, potential predator in india it's a very highly potential predator compared to other uh, exotic predator this could be used in the uh, biological control of mealybugs the problem was this predator you know occurs in india burma sri lanka philippines java indonesia bangladesh so southeast asian countries but uh, several years uh, this is the life cycle this you know butterfly completes life cycle by 23 to 28 days these are the stages and this is the male and female butterfly so this uh, butterfly is a voracious uh, the larva voracious feeder on uh, mealybugs and they feed and completely devour the mealybug population in the field but mass rearing of this butterfly could not be possible for about 30 years because we did not understand their basic behavior the adults did not match in captivity uh, mate in captivity adults did not mate in lab cage adults did not mate in outdoor cage and mass rearing was not possible for about 30 years by several uh, organizations in india both uh, uh, agriculture university and weather uh, uh, several icmr university so we got a project and we tried whether uh, because the male and female are not copulating under cap uh, captivity that's why inside the cage they may not be uh, 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 you know mating that's why you have used outside cage about 6 uh, by 6 uh, feet cage Uh, there also they were not meeting mating and then we used the bush there also they were not mating and then we used a very long 6 uh, by 6 10 meter very big cage there also they are not mating and finally we were you know uh, desperately trying whether it is possible or not because uh, several years uh, you know several organizations have been trying and it was not possible and finally we tried we kept the large bush you know the canopy tree inside the cage and for our astonishment they started the mating because this butterfly is a perching butterfly they perch the male will perch in the canopy this is the thick canopy and this is the, the you know the medium thick canopy this is the thin canopy here with spaces and there you know they may uh, the perch the male will perch in different places on the canopy about 8 to 10 meter uh, height and then you know attracts the female if any intruder male will come here they will go for straight uh, fight or for circling fight and most of the time the resident male will win the intruder will be you know chased away and they will mate with the female so you can see here this is the the territory about 6 to 9 meter height territory is 1 meter radius here distance between the perch point is about 20, 20 to 25 cm and there will be a neutral space between different territories we could uh, 
uh, you know, uh, record the three courtship behavior in both the males and females, about 22 behavior out of 22, the seven behaviors are common to both sexes. Uh, so 22 pre courtship behavior, pre coupling behavior, coupling behavior, post coupling behavior, totally 22 behavior acts we could observe here. You can see here, this is the male perching here and then it will be playing. The female will enter the territory and then both will go for mating and finally there will be a mating. If the canopy height is about six to nine meter height and if canopy is not there, they will not mate and they will not, uh, female will not be fertilized. So this is how they mate and then female will be fertilized and copulation duration is about one hour. So of course uh, there is a video, but a shortage of time, I will go next further. So the adults mate, you know, day after eclosion in the outdoor mating cage and mating generally occurs between 11 to 14 hours under bright or diffused uh, sunlight. The males with multiple mating is shown and uh, more number of mating one and two days old adults than in three days old adult. So you can see here the ethogram of mating behavior the territory marking, the perching by male, inspection by male, basking by male because they bask under the sunlight, they get more energy so, so that they can fight with the intruder male and then they can chase away, chasing the intruder male straight away and chasing the intruder by circling flight. And then, you know, the territorial entry, female entering the, uh, you know, the territory, both will go for uh, flight pursuit initiation of courtship flight, courtship flight again will be continued and then uh, male tracking the female uh, that, that is the resting uh, female and then alighting on the vegetation and then you know crawling towards the male, uh, female, the male walk towards the female, abdomen rising by the uh, you know the female and then parallel position and finally abdomen bending and copulation. So these are the behavioral act we could see. And then, you know, the uh, couple rotation, the couple abdomen uh, rising, the pair in copula flight, uh, copula termination, all these uh, behavioral, we have recorded about uh, 22 behavioral acts. Apart from this, though this is the instinct behavior, this is also under the control of external factors like sunlight. You can see under bright sunlight, the mating is uh, high during morning, uh, 10 to 11, and uh, under uh, bright sunlight afternoon, mating is less. Under diffused sunlight, 11 to 12 hour mating is high. Under overcast sky, the mating will be in the afternoon. So the external factors also plays a very important role uh, here. You can see the highest mating under brain, brain, bright light, and then diffused light, and then overcast sky. So you can see here, but the female for only for copulation, they require canopy of six to eight meter uh, height. There only they mate. But for egg laying, even with or without canopy, or with or without bush, wherever mealybugs are there, they go and deposit the eggs even in the any height of the plants because mealybugs we can see in uh, any uh, plants. So that height will be varying only for their mating. So several years and then, you know, uh, because of uh, we developed the mating and then, you know, we mass multiplied them, the uh, mealybugs can be ma multi mass multiplied on the pumpkins in the laboratory and then it can be kept for egg laying from this uh, 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 butterfly and then they can be read in the laboratory using these cases. You can see here, these are the population reared and then successfully we could uh, develop, you know, the mass breeding and using them as a potential predator for the control of various species of mealybugs. The conclusion here, the mass rearing method has been developed for the apply after understanding its mating, uh, basic mating behavior. Unless, you know, several years it was not possible because we did not understand their perching behavior in a uh, particular height of the canopy. And that's why this larvae is uh, very, a voracious potential predator and this uh, predator can be used in India or worldwide for the control of you know the mealybugs. That's why the basic behavior and we can you know study 
the various aspects of behavior using insects even uh, without much uh, you know uh, money involved uh, any project the youngsters can do the work so with this i thank university grant commission for uh, giving me this project and also i thank priyesh dinesh project fellow who did a you know in this project i thank you all for patient <laughs> so thank you all thank you sir thank you for that informative plenary talk uh and spark the sapiens it okay thank you jason it was again uh, back to 2005 only that uh, we are seeing this powerpoint presentation but it was like sitting in your class again the same informative uh explanation thank you very much sir for accepting oh, and being thank you here thank you motivating all the audience thank you very much well this is dr shakuntala shridhara oh thank you madam thank you very much uh, thank you dr venkatesh it was a very good uh, informative uh, talk yeah i wanted to publish it within 45 minutes that's why yeah i just want to know whether you had any collaboration with the nbir yeah the, we have given this technology to icr so uh, they, they, they were breeding uh, they because started there was a lot of work on prediction pathogens of uh, yes, 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 uh, yes. earlier uh -huh. earlier you know horticulture institute nba they were all uh, working even uh -huh. not agriculture university but uh, we could not uh, mass breed them in the laboratory we developed this technique and now this technique is available and uh, Uh, Horticulture Institute uh, now already started uh, multiplying them. This can become an industry, right? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh -huh. It's a very potential now, predator. Ah, uh, now yes. that you are retired, uh, you can start an industry. I think. Yeah, yeah, because I have some huh? other, uh, you know. Uh, you can, if you can tie up with the Department of Agriculture, you can have a wide market. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For this, definitely. for we this, we can do that. Uh, oh. Thank you, Madam, for inviting me to this uh, conference. Okay. all the best thank you so thank you jay shankar welcome sir my privilege uh now we are done with the uh, the plenary and we are moving on as i said to the next plenary uh, where uh, we have mr avinash with us avinash can you confirm your presence avinash can you hear us Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are audible. Um, something, yeah. Are you sharing your slide, or it's still uh, vintage, sir? I think. Yeah. Um, I can leave. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you can unshare, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. Avinash, you can. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's over to Avinash. Um, we have the student volunteer to introduce Avinash. Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. A very warm welcome to everyone present here. It is a great pleasure that we have Mr. Avinash Krishnan with us here on this occasion. Avinash Krishnan is a large mammal ecologist studying human-animal interactions in southern India since 2007. He has been instrumental in establishing baseline research and conservation practices in the Banargata Hosur landscape. Key aspects of elephant management through studies related to population, behavior, conflict, habitat connectivity, and community outreach. He is an alumnus of the Wildlife Conservation and Management Program at the University of Reading, United Kingdom. He currently serves as the director at A Rocha India, which is an international conservation NGO. and holds advisory roles with wildlife trust of india and other state forest departments we are very happy that you are here with us sir over to you yeah hi thanks uh, uh, firstly first firstly thank you for having me uh, if i could go ahead can you see my screen yes avinash it's getting shared but can you can you see it the slides were there now we don't see 
Yeah, for being here. I, well, I don't know how to do this. Uh, I think you're logged in with two devices. No, can I go out from one? Okay. That was Maria Titus who introduced you. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, Avinash, uh, you're you have logged in in two devices. Hope that does not create any question. No, I... Can you see? The, can you see one of the one of the screens I'm trying to share? I yes. Mean... Yes, it's getting shared. Yes, it's shared. Can you make it a full screen? Yeah. Now. Not it. It's still in the slideshow arrangement mode. Well, I think there's a maps in the internet, I think. Now, now is it loading? No, no, no. Can you unshare and uh, reshare again? Yeah. Uh, you're trying to unshare and then uh, reshare it. Can you hear Avinash? Hello. Avinash, am I okay? You are rejoining. Okay. Yeah, you rejoined. Yes. Okay, now I I'll just switch that. Um, I'll switch my PPT into a PDF. Can you see this? It's getting loaded. Yes, it is visible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, firstly, before I end up uh, going uh, offline again, sorry, I'm I'm apologize for the technical inconvenience. I'm I'm not in town and not in front of my desk. So with very limited internet, I'll try and. Um, uh, to share some insights about the topic that I was given to speak. Uh, and firstly, before I could start, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Sridhara and uh, Dr. Jayashankar for giving uh, me the opportunity to share uh, some, some of my insights into uh, human health and conflict, which is something that I've been uh, researching for, for, for more than a decade now. And uh, thank you, organizers, and thank you, the student who introduced me. So quickly to um, go ahead and uh, touch upon the topic that I've been asked to speak about. So my talk is going to be on developing resilience in the management of human health and conflict. Of course, human health and conflict is, is, is a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty old uh, situation in India, at least. And it's transformed over eons. So my talk today is going to essentially touch upon some important aspects of management and uh, some empirical evidence or data that has come through research that could contribute to effective management of human health and conflict. Uh, at any point, if you can't hear me, please please interject and and um, and you can stop and I can I can see if my network is back. Um, so quickly, the word conflict is very subject subjective. A lot of people have different opinions about calling calling uh, the term like conflict, especially when you have animals involved. Uh, animals involved. So. So, so my work is essentially to try and understand the reasons as to what this negative interaction or conflict that we we call. I mean, the other the other aspect of conflict is, of course, uh, both parties here in the case of, of humans and elephants are somewhere experience detrimental detrimental impacts in in, in terms of their lifestyles and livelihoods. Uh, so, if you look at India alone, I mean, at least between 24 to 20, 2014 to 2015, over 2,000 people were killed by elephants and tigers. Now, elephants and tigers do engage in conflict, and uh, the reason being that they could be potent, they, they are, they tend to be potentially dangerous animals. 
so the tolerance levels when it comes to these two animals are fairly reduced where communities live around them and um, and if you also look at in terms of human intervention like between 2016 29 29 you know, 32000 animals especially cattle elephants lions leopards were killed well so host of wildlife gets into conflict and in terms in this case uh, because of something like railway tracks which is linear infrastructure uh, 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 change in land use does affect uh, quality of habitat that is available for wildlife and with about with 1.3 billion people we're about 70 percent of the world's population and and in case of wildlife about tens and thousands of animals nestled between in about five percent of protected area network conflict is gen generally inevitable in, in at least in the indian context right so if you look at elephants for that matter i mean we're looking at a roughly about one one to two people dying every year every day uh, because of human elephant conflict and about 250 elephants uh, dying every year and uh, in terms of crop depredation we have about one million people that does get affected by conflict alone especially with elephants um, so 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 this is definitely a management problem i mean management in the in, in the sense that both people and elephants do live in the same kind of landscape ecosystem and because of increased competition between both these species, uh, management of human elephant, human wildlife conflict is somewhere inevitable, right? And 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 which needs to be the foremost concern, especially with stakeholders. Stakeholders, I, stakeholders, I mean, both forest department researchers, scientists, all of those who are in, involved in management of wildlife uh, have to factor in these aspects. So, firstly, before to get to that point, I think it's it's essentially important to understand what are the challenges. Uh, associated with the management of human life. Firstly, life. Uh, the problem increases or exacerbates when life is involved because one is that there could be permanent death or deformity. People get killed by elephants. Depredations in terms of livelihood because it kind of uh, forages upon uh, crops and crops are probably livelihood items for people. And because of that, because of this, when livelihood is affected, when and when, when there is uh, when there is people that are killed and, and, and you know, in cases of uh, deformity or injury, uh, there's there's total sense of unemployment. So life is an important aspect that needs to be considered when it comes to management. Secondly, lifestyle. Lifestyle is a huge, huge issue, especially if you look at multiple use landscapes where people and, and wildlife kind of overlap between each other. So in terms of in terms of lifestyle, living standards are compromised, there's stress in communities that are affected by wildlife. And of course, daily routines are largely influenced by the presence and absence of these animals. And it also influences cooperation because there's trade relationship between stakeholders, you know, the people who want to save elephants and people who want to protect elephants or manage elephants are of course looked in a very negative sense when you look at um, issues like human elephant conflict. So cooperation is, 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 is a pivotal concern. Uh, reduced tolerances, lack of support, all these influences the cooperation angle, right? Uh, people are uh, exposed to human elephant conflict, and over the over the time, and if conflict is not mitigated or addressed, then lack of su support for conservation and and reduced tolerance for protection also tends to loom large in, in society. And livelihood, of course, uh, uh, like I uh, like mentioned, life and livelihood cannot be looked at as an individual thing; both are interconnected. So, if you look at livelihood, injury is there, death is there, and fear of even living around potentially dangerous animals exists. Um, so, how do we develop resilience? So, firstly, we need to understand the foremost background to uh, understanding both people and animals, especially with animals. See, wildlife is essentially a property of the government, it's probably of the state, wherever it's present. So, the onus is there on laws. So, that you have strict laws that kind of convene, strict laws that kind of convene, uh, uh, which convene. Uh, uh, protection for these animals because if you look at the elephant uh, it's protected under the wildlife protection act 1972 uh, so the onus is such that this animal receives the highest protection as per this law and if you look at human beings of course you can't manage them but human beings are adherent to the constitution so the onus is essentially on rights so like it, it's absolutely uh, acceptable if people ex express their angst when there's a case of human elephant conflict because uh, people have right to life, Article 21. So, so if if they are citizens and if they are part of the constitution, then they have absolute uh, 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 absolute rights to prevail uh, when it comes to uh, expecting elevation in terms of conflict. So, the challenge is with conflict is this. So, so where do we manage conflict and how do we manage conflict? Why does conflict happen? 
like for instance if you look at multiple use landscapes where you find wildlife in different like if you look at this map the map of the landscape where i've been studying there's hardly any difference between where wildlife has to be there and where people have to be so three broad categories of where you can essentially find wildlife you find wildlife inside forests which is typical i mean sorry you find communities living inside forests typically in forest villages or enclosures then you have the classical interface model where you have forest farm you have forest on one side people on the other side and then you have completely people dominated area completely human dominated area where you have plantation groves or estates so now when you look at this kind of interface it's difficult to draw lines and boundaries and say where wildlife needs to be there where people needs to be there in case and with with animals like the elephant when they are such long ranging animals it's essentially impossible to draw lines and say where they have to live so uh, before managing and addressing or mitigating conflict one needs to be aware of the causal factors causal factors for human wildlife conflict are very very pivotal to understand long term solutions for uh, either it's about uh, protecting the species or it's also essentially to manage the problem so that tolerance is achieved and this cooperation between stakeholders largely largely in the conservation sense uh, one is primarily animal behavior because if you look at elephants they are highly cognitive animals so there is tendencies that individuals have higher conflict propensities habitat fragmentation is a classic problem especially in in, in a in, in a country like india where the 1.3 billion people land use keeps changing uh and uh, and uh, linear infrastructure yeah uh, so the changes change in land use essentially affects affects uh, people's uh, 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 livelihoods and also animals deprived of space um and habitat degradation especially if you look at elephants for instance when habitat gets fragmented uh habitat gets fragmented. um the quality of habitat reduces so there's absolutely no viable uh, space for uh, wildlife especially like elephants to live and in many cases with elephants especially with with the recent estimate of 29000 elephants in this country uh, some of our protected area networks are not able to confine these elephants within this available land area so the chances that animals tend to overpopulate themselves and move out into other areas and management of course sometimes if it's done effectively can be a good solution for the human wildlife conflict but sometimes when we don't manage wildlife properly then we tend to induce or exacerbate the issue of human health so what are the larger models uh, that are governed for mitigation one is the structural barrier concept which is done by the government several types of fences or barriers that are used to you know uh, you know draw a line between where animals and people need to live and in worst cases uh, we are looking at uh, issues like mechanical management which is capture relocation where problem animals are captured and moved uh, into permanent uh, captivity and then you have uh, something that is more passive which is about creating excretion or compensation uh, wherein uh, the affected parties are kind of offset it for the damage um, what is done by the other half of society now one is the government the private the public uh, representation and then you have the private representation is largely governed by non governmental organizations and other interested individuals and agencies so we we look at community based conservation model where we build in capacity within communities to try and be resilient of human wildlife help and conflict to some sense of education and outreach which uh, kind of kind of creates awareness and sensitization about the causal factors that i already mentioned and then offsetting looking at uh, uh, you know relief or kind of mechanisms that can kind of offset the kind of <clears throat> damage or depredations that they experience um so quickly to come to my case study and uh, the case study that i uh, that i want to i thought i'd like to present which i mentioned in my abstract is a very interesting landscape called the banal ghatta hosu landscape complex now this is uh, a region in southern india just south of bangalore about 30 kilometers you have this landscape um so if you look at this landscape it's it comprises of two protected areas uh, when i say protected areas i mean areas that are managed by the government one is the banagata national park which is about 200 odd square kilometers and then we have north kaveri wildlife sanctuary which is about 500 odd square kilometers roughly about um, uh, roughly about 700 odd square kilometers and if you look at in, it, uh, this landscape in, in terms of elephant population there are about 700 elephants in this area and if you look at uh, human densities you are about roughly 2000 people per square kilometer um what are the major conflicting animals in this landscape of course the elephant like i'm speaking about and then you have wild pig and the leopard um this landscape is connected by um two inter three three corridors two interstate and one which which was uh, highlighted by uh, a publication called right to passage uh, done by wildlife trust of india 
so this is a very complex mosaic landscape. It's uh, it's definitely multiple use. You have different types of uh, human settlements and forest interspersed, forming a, a very different matrix to you know kind of manage conflict. Uh, in this area, especially, we have what we classically call a bull problem. Right? Um, we have a lot of males, especially in Asian elephant societies. Uh, if if you understand, elephants males are largely solitary, uh, and and generally, in the case of conflict, they have higher propensities to conflict. This is a behavioral thing that has been documented and established through research. Uh, so we have a lot of elephants that are largely bulls that engage in seasonal conflict. But over the years, we were also witnessing conflict with, to occur at an annual scale. Um, so, um, so in this case, what happens is when these bulls engage in conflict, there's a direct uh, application of influencing population. Because when we lose out a lot of bulls in, in the population, then it has, it leads something known as genetic skewness and this influences the, the stability of the population of the long term. Like the reason why I'm saying this is because when in most cases when bulls engage in conflict they either get killed or captured and removed out of the population. Um, now what is the interesting bit about this landscape is that we're looking at long distance dispersed, right? The classic notion of human wild elephant conflict would be elephants coming out and raiding crops, you know, <laughs> in different land use patterns and then coming back to the forest. So this is what we call as classic conflict behavior, at least from a management perspective. But in this landscape, especially and, and many other landscapes, this emerging trend begins to happen where elephants tend to leave their natal home ranges and move into areas that are non-elephant habitats but cause conflict. So this is a direct spread and transfer of conflict. Like if you look at uh, Panagata National Park, for instance, as an example, you have about four wildlife ranges. And in, in the southernmost range, which is at the confluence of the other protected area, of course, when we say protected area, we mean it from an anthropocentric sense. But for elephants, they don't differentiate between Tamil Nadu or Karnataka or Banargata or North Kaveri. Uh, so when we're looking at uh, barriers, uh, which, which I said is one of the mechanisms in mitigating conflict, we're looking at several breaches, uh, despite uh, great efforts being put by the government in terms of managing elephants or rather containing them in the so-called protected area framework. Um, we are also looking at a lot of human settlements with, which is interspersed with the forest, forming a very human forest kind of mosaic, leading into a lot of porosity where elephants you know, tend to come into these human use areas causing conflict. And in terms of fencing or management of this, we've seen a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to erection and management of fences. Um, some of the major aspects that we've identified and what we think could be addressed from a potential mitigation perspective would be to look at fencing because this ends up being the first layer of defense line. Uh, although a lot of people do not agree with, with fencing, but sometimes in, in elephant areas, fencing is probably the first layer of defense apart from active mitigation like driving operation, which are tend, but tend not to be successful because not knowing the animal movement patterns, sometimes you know we tend to impede on uh, mitigation efforts. So over the years, we realized that between interstate areas where the two different management mechanisms that occur, uh, especially in this Banargata Fusil complex, there is hardly any cooperation. There are several factors, such as habitat factors, contour factors, leading into like all these points that are highlighted in them self explanatory. So these are all those small and technical and structural, if these aspects have been looked at, like for instance, managing uh, solar fences, for example, one of the various uh, barrier uh, mechanisms to control elephants from coming into human use areas. Um, we could we can try and improvise our mitigation strategy. And several such landscape specific kind of interventions like looking at uh, interbarrier distance where you have these multiple layers of barriers, uh, sometimes managing them or effectively uh, ensuring that uh, structural fences are maintained and uh, is installed in the right way tends to, you know, uh, manage conflict more effectively at a site specific level. Um, so some of the efforts that we've taken as as a stakeholder, uh, stakeholder, stakeholder to uh, kind of uh, create cooperation about line agencies. When I mean line agencies, I mean to say uh, all the people that are involved in uh, managing conflict, especially in this landscape. Uh, we uh, we have constituted a five point agenda between two state governments which essentially looks at forest fire management, wildlife corridors, human elephant conflict training, uh, combating poaching and traffic. Um, so what we've realized uh, is that uh, once uh, these important aspects of 
uh, human wildlife conflict or generally forest conservation or wildlife management is brought into the forte of governing agencies when i mean governing agencies i mean respective state governments it's important to try and push for uh, maximum conservation benefits especially for elephants in this case like in this landscape the major challenges that i got a railway line where we've had numerous uh, elephant deaths that have crossed the railway line uh, when it comes to managing the driving elephants we've seen several issues with uh, uh, interstate coordination where elephants are either pushed from one quarry, one protected area to the other or and or vice versa and we do not have any kind of uh, real time or technology interventions to understand the movement or uh, or understand uh, how elephants can be actively mitigated so so keeping these constraints in mind we've we formulated a kind of cooperation between two states to try and address uh, problems which are quite common like i said these landscapes are just connected by forests and when they're connected by forest, the elephant here and elephant there is more or less the same. So sometimes bringing management in a more efficient uh, uh, manner helps in you know, managing conflict in a, in a more streamlined sense. Uh, change in land use is, of course, like I mentioned, is one of the major causal factors of habitat fragmentation, habitat degradation. So over the years of research, I've understood that change in land use has also influenced attitudes of people living with them, which in turn links to management, perception, and several other factors. So if you can look at the map on the right side, you clearly understand that. Um, so the green areas indicate uh, uh, protected area networks. And if you see the yellow areas kind of indicate where elephants are. So if you look at that, if you kind of put that in totality, then we're looking at roughly about. It's not necessarily confined. So land use management is very, very essential to have either spaces earmarked for elephants or for people or you know probably having a space where both can perhaps coexist. So if you look at uh, uh, the system in Banagata, if you look at this land use issue where fragmentation and degradation kind of influences uh, how elephants and how human elephant conflict is managed, a classic example would be uh, a map of Banagata in the 1950s and a map of Banagata between 1980. Sorry, this is a time series map, but since it's a PDF, um, I couldn't show you. But but if you look at this reduction in habitat, it's literally about 50% of elephant viable habitat being reduced in just about one elephant's lifetime, you know, what elephants live for about 60 years. And what we're trying to do today in terms of management is trying to alleviate that suffering by giving something known as excretion and compensation, which is not essentially addressing the, the, the larger picture. The larger picture is that habitat has reduced considerably. And in a case like the elephant, a log ranging, a long living animal, anything that it experiences when it's young and, you know, and if it sees so much of habitat change, uh, habitat reduced rather then conflict is going to have long-term implications rather than short-term things so we need to look at it in a very holistic and a multi-dimensional aspect um so we are also looking at several other causal factors i mean i'm just trying to reiterate some of the causal factors like wildlife trafficking uh, this has also wildlife trafficking in the sense um, uh, in the sense where animals are either uh, deprived of their uh, ability to live or be resilient in ecosystem for instance uh, uh, we realize that because of the change in land use uh, we're also looking at elephants especially occupying human use areas and having different forage preferences this is one of the studies that our students have done to look at forage preferences where you're looking at conflicts like i mentioned earlier to, to occur from an annual scale to from a seasonal scale to more of an annual scale uh, even in uh, human dominated areas especially when it comes to different uh, fruiting trees with one of the studies that we've uh, highlighted. Uh, we are also looking at something known as uh, conflict or electrocution or even targeted killing of animals where select animals because of wanton killing or revenge killing certain animals are uh, identified and targeted and removed out of the population by people. Uh, one another classic case is that you know this is a form of poaching where you know tusks are being harvested from carcasses. So you have elephants that either naturally die or you know die accidentally or incidentally. Uh, these tusks are harvested and you know brought into that wildlife trafficking framework. Uh, capture and release of animals have also occurred in this landscape where some conflict elephants have been captured in one place and shifted to another place. But that has not solved the problem of conflict, but has transferred conflict from one place to another. Um, and and the most important empirical reason for all of this is to not be able to understand the elephant as a species. That it's, it, it is it is uh, an, a, cogn a, cog a cognitive animal it has very strong social bonds and uh, to understand elephant behavior is very very important to manage conflict and also to define 
space use or home ranges that elephants operate in. So if you do not account all these aspects, especially linked to elephant biology, then uh, conflict management becomes very half-hearted. Um, so when we look at conflict in this landscape, or conflict management in this landscape, of course, all of this is based on empirical science that, that we've generated over the years. Uh, we've realized that improving habitat quality by preventing anthropogenic uh, factors such as wood cutting, uh, which reduces the forest quality, and we look at enhanced mitigation measures, which I mean, which I mean to be very site specific in certain areas. Uh, we're also looking at land use planning, which I mentioned earlier. We're looking at certain spaces where elephants we believe should not be there, and certain places where people should not be there. So we cannot, in most cases, we cannot have this harmonious relationship between elephants and people, in my opinion, because both are potentially dangerous for each other. Law and enforcement in ensuring ensuring better management and ensuring that protection is enforced in these areas. Sometimes populations also need to be monitored on the long term to look at trends and how the population is either stabilizing or perishing. These aspects need to be looked at. And when it comes to severe cases of conflict, and especially in the Banagada Hussein landscape, we're realizing that the, the several areas, at least site specific areas, experience higher levels of conflict compared to other areas. So conflict spread is not uniform. So in areas of high conflict areas, I think we need to look at fast track relief mechanisms so that there is some sense of tolerance and acceptance of development, despite having so much of a long history with the species. Um, so these are some of the insights that I thought maybe I could, uh, uh, from, a, from a manager's point of view, uh, at least from because conflict today, of course, it's, it's a lot of research involved in understanding the species, both humans and elephants. But, but in the 21st century, I think conflict is more of a management problem. And I think as, as stakeholders, we need to look at it uh, because it's an exacerbated situation. You have uh, cases of conflict almost every day. And, and both, both parties, both elephants and people, uh, experience the challenges. Uh, associated with it. So, so with that, I thought I could um, quickly end my uh, talk. And uh, if there are any questions, I hope you were able to understand the concept and hope I was clear uh, with uh, the limited network that I've had. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Avinash, for that uh, insightful presentation on the landscape and the conflict that prevails and uh, what sort of mitigatory measures are being uh, undertaken. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, despite your uh, uh, location that you are in, you are sitting in field and you have taken this uh, pain of uh, presenting the uh, work and your plenary talk. Thank you for that. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, if there are any questions from the audience, you want to get clarification one or two, you can ask uh, Vinash. Okay, if there are no questions, you can write to us. We will uh, convey it to Avinash to get a reply back to you. Okay, thank you, Avinash, uh, once again. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jay Shankar. It was such a privilege to share. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Yeah, so he's happy to have you in St. Joseph's. Thanks, thank you. Product thank of you. Joseph's. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. She's still online. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, well. madam is there. Yeah. So now we will move on to the last plenary of the two day. Uh, lecture at uh, the conference. We are waiting for uh, Dr. Gauri Shankar to join. I will just confirm that. Yeah. If not, uh, let the oral presenters uh, pending and the info poster presenters be ready so that uh, we can uh, go ahead. Yeah, 345 sir will join. Okay, I'll confirm that. Is Dr. Sangeeta with us in the meet? Okay, anybody wants uh, who has left in the oral presentation wants to furnish their presentation? Mr. Ramesh Kumar is here. Okay. Dr. Sumit Kohli.
fine. So we are now exactly into the gap between two lectures here. We are on uh, dot actually. Uh, sir, uh, I'm ready with my info poster. Can I present it now? Obviously, yeah. I'm uh, waiting for the chairpersons. Yes, Dr. Yes. Subha is with us. Uh, no, Dr. Subha is also not. Dr. Subha and Dr. Sangeeta is supposed to chair. That's the reason. No problem. Dr. Santosh is here. Dr. Santosh Jagadishan. Okay, we'll have a small tea break. Technically, this should have been um, for poster. Yeah. Yeah, this exactly is the tea break. So please have your tea break. Uh, 345, we will start with uh, the plenary on uh, King Cobras. And then uh, 330 to 345, but we will uh, have a 10 minutes break, tea break, and then resume because we had two continuous plenaries and the last plenary and finally the info, info poster and get into the validity. So a brief 10 minute break and uh, let's resume. Uh, Gauri Shankar sir, can you hear me? You are not audible sir. Can you unmute sir? Uh, am I audible? Gauri Shankar sir. Yes, hello. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking yes. to me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear me uh, now? Yes, sir. Yeah, very much. You want to do the trial? We have a five minute tea break. Okay. So, yeah. Let's do that. Yes. One sir. second. Hold on. Okay, laptop is connected. Okay, do you see me? Hello? Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. we can. So yeah. you go what? to the box with the arrow up for the share desktop. Okay. Once you click that, you will get three options. The first one shows screen and share. And that's screen window. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you click on that, you will see the entire screen option. Okay. And you click on the entire screen. That makes your desktop visible to everyone. Wherever you have kept your PPT, you can open it. Yes. You have to minimize this one. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. It's all set. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that, right? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, let's if you use want to run, Okay. Yeah. Is there a video? Can you see the video? Uh, moving slow, but it is playing. Okay. Uh, what about this one? <coughs> yeah, slow. The videos are going slow, but yeah, it is playing. Yeah. 
play okay uh, so i am also visible uh, you want me to keep my video on or off yes sir your choice no problem no issues okay perfect so it's going on right yes sir this video is also going on okay perfect okay perfect then you escape go back so stop sharing it stop sharing now yes yes done okay another okay five, another 5 minutes sir then we'll resume this yeah meeting. sure okay i'll be online only right yes sir you can perfect thanks thanks yeah. you are perfectly visible gauri sorry you are perfectly visible don't worry okay thanks <laughs> thank you this is chetan chetan how are you <laughs> fine thank you perfect wait i'll just uh, go through my presentation once and just reorganize sure, sure, sure. and i'll get back to you soon bye, bye. sure sure go ahead please good luck
Okay, uh, welcome all to the last session of uh, the two-day national conference on recent trends in animal behavior with the focal theme of human-animal conflict. Gauri sir, you are with us. Hello. Sorry. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, the participants, we will start with the last session. Uh, the student volunteer to introduce, sir, is there? Yes, sir. You are ready. Okay. Uh, so, we will try to go to oh, Kishan. Kishan is here to introduce uh, the Gauri, sir, for us. The last plenary of this conference, as I said. After this, we have a one-hour slot uh, or even lesser than that to finish all the four poster presentations. Mm -hmm and then we'll get into the valedictory program. Uh, now over to Kishan to introduce sir for us, and sir takes over to present the plenary talk. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you, Jay Shankar sir, for giving me this opportunity uh, to introduce our plenary speaker for this afternoon and evening almost. Uh, Gauri Shankar is a wildlife biologist and a TED speaker, and also the co-founder director of Kalinga Foundation, which is a research and conservation organization based in uh, Agumbe, Karnataka. He has been studying king cobras for almost two decades now, and has enrolled as a PhD candidate at North Orissa University, Odisha, and is also a former exchange student at Uppsala University, Sweden. He has recently published his discovery of presence of four species of king cobras as against one, as believed for the last 185 years. His interest is in evolutionary biology and is studying the phylogeography of king cobras across Southeast Asia. He has authored and co-authored several scientific papers on king cobras, other herpetological topics, and book reviews as well. Without, for, without further ado, I... I ask Gauri Shankar sir to start off. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here and giving this talk. Uh, the power just went off. Uh, I don't think so. My video will help much. Uh, it's very dark here. So I'm going to keep my um, the video off. I'm in this beautiful place and uh, humpy. Uh, I was about to go and check out uh, the sloth bears. But I'm here and talking to you guys. But anyway, tomorrow I will do that. I'll catch up. And I hope you guys had a beautiful time for almost two days now. And uh, let's get into the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, wait, I should. This one. Desktop. You guys see my presentation now? Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes Good. Good. So, <clears throat> because it's a behavior uh, uh, symposium, so I thought I will uh, dig my old uh, uh, records or data. This paper I, I haven't published. So, I have a lot of data 
So I tried to compile it. I did write this, but never uh, uh, published it, but I hope to publish it soon. So I'll try to give whatever possible, whatever I found, but rest, everything is in my field notes. So then if I, if I go wrong somewhere, yeah. Okay, good. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about a species which is one of the longest venomous snake in the India, in, in, the, in the world actually, you know. So king cobras, like uh, the who were introduced, he mentioned, I just published a paper where if you see here, the Alapidae and the genus, it says Ophifagus and the species, it says Hana, that is, this is a monotypic genus. There is only one species uh, was there till August across uh, its distribution from India all the way to Philippines. But after my study came up, now it's four species, it's not one anymore. So by next presentation, in case if you attend or if you see me giving it, I'm going to change the genus of Ophifagus and the species, whichever, whoever are going to talk, it's going to change now. So it'll be a different species after some time, you know. I'm going to name it them soon. I've submitted pa my paper. Cool. So like I mentioned, so they can grow up to five meters. That's the longest venomous snake in the world. Yeah, and weighing up to six kilos. I've caught uh, specimens which weigh close to 10 kilos, right? And I've also caught specimens which weigh 12 kilos. You might ask me, how is it? That's the That's really large if you don't know. That's too much from six kilos to 12 kilos. It's double, right? So the, my point is seven feet, I mean, seven kilo, a 12 or 13 feet male had eaten another male, which had weighed about five kilos. The total measurement came, I mean, uh, the weighing came up to 12 kilos. So this is the cannibal, cannibalistic you know, snake. And uh, I caught a snake, a uh, king cobra specimen, which had eaten or swallowed another male so those total 12 kilos but that's not counted i would say 10 kilos would be the largest king cobra i ever caught and uh, king cobras are just like tigers you know one of the largest distributed uh, snake i would say right from india all the way to philippines the entire south and southeast asian countries which includes the forest your shrubland your grasslands and wetlands you know rainforest most of the habitat in south and southeast asia King cobras are found. Good. And feeding. Again, something special about this species is they are exclusively snake eaters. They feed only on other snakes. They don't feed on amphibians. They don't feed on uh, birds. They don't feed on uh, mammals. They feed just on reptiles, particularly other snakes. Occasionally, monitor lizards. This is the photo which was taken recently, just not even two weeks ago. Uh, one tiny king cobra which had swallowed which tried swallowing a huge monitor lizard but it tried for almost one and a half days that is today evening next day morning again he came back tried swallowing but he couldn't then finally he abandoned this monitor lizard which was already dead so we just left it there so they do feed on monitor lizards other than snakes Cool. So a slight introduction to my subject here, behavior, which is intra and intra intra specific behavior. Um, so you see, sexual dimorphism plays a very significant role in identification or diversifying conspecific male and female uh, their traits. You know, so few few snakes are easily distinguishable between male and female. Few are not, but still, uh, if you go to the next level. The male and female identification happens through the uh, sexual pheromones, you know. Um, so <clears throat> other sexual selection and mating systems, you know, they are influenced on behavior and psychology of animals. It's very, very important here. And particularly this species, which is cannibalistic. If there is any uh, sexual selection going wrong, the male gets eaten up by the female or female gets eaten up by the male. And uh, so one, the conspecific uh, social behavior is one such features, you know, that uh, influences the sex, you know, it's very, very important. And here in the wild, they might bump into each other like male and female once in two years or three years, we, are, we don't know. But in case if they bump into, it's very, very important behavior for them, how to behave. And uh, so, 
uh, basically uh, what i'm going to talk about is the male male interactions and male female female interactions which differ uh, in their uh, uh, behavior elements what i uh, mean is when they threatened or when they see a mating pair or a, a mating pair or any situation uh, their their behavior completely changes which is not normal that's what i meant here and uh, it is this particular behavioral differences uh, that distinguishes inter and intrasexual uh, interactions between adults of course with the young ones we haven't seen much uh, um, behavior most of the time they just take off but once they reach adulthood uh, all these behaviors play a very important role and um, it's also very very important that uh, these elements uh, might occur in both sometimes while others may not also so we should be careful in this and uh, <clears throat> my objective here was when i was looking at them when i was observing them in the wild uh, before the radio telemetry was uh, introduced i don't know how many people follow us uh, we were the first people to put transmitters to the king cobras during 2008 and monitor them for a long period and these observations what i'm talking about were made before the transmitters were uh, used so these were completely wild observations so my point was are king cobras polyandry or polygyny you know that i wanted to know whether females mate with several males and males again have several females or what exactly the behavior is uh, or like or uh, mm, a few birds which do they pair up together and just stay together for a long time and uh, also i wanted to know uh, there's a lot of male combat happening. Does size plays an important role here? The females or the smaller males? Yes. Does anyone want to ask something? Or I continue. I, I think uh, somebody's uh, mic is also on. You can keep it off if you want. If you don't want to ask anything. Cool. So this study is not easy because we have very, very less data. If you see a lot of data available on, you know, on, on European snakes or American snakes, American snakes, particularly the garden snake. But if you look at the alapids, particularly the fixed fang snakes, there's very little data uh, available uh, so far right now, you know. But yes, there are uh, data on lizards, which I also used to, uh, to, to compile my data and understand things better. But luckily, there's just very, very few documentation, what I call as past work by Vese. Um, he was apparently was the first one to uh, um, report or record the deposition of eggs and guarding of nest by the king cobra. You know, after that, Fenton and Smith and uh, Mastel uh, described the nest in detail. And there's also one GHE Leakey in 1976. Uh, he also recorded about 11 king cobra nests in Thailand. And James o. Oliver was the first one to observe the mating behaviors in captivity. When I say captivity, they are put in this in a room and see what they do, you know. Uh, and Patrick Butchfull, also uh, one of the senior most herpetologists, uh, uh, he also uh, wrote a paper on the similar uh, uh, behavior. And uh, he, rep uh, he he something he reports about the threatening behavior uh, between males and submissive courtship behavior of, between male and female. So this helped me a lot uh, in collecting data in the wild. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know what is a submissive behavior or you know how do the males threaten, threaten each other. Uh, so this helped me a little bit. And also he mentions very short comeback dance. Uh, he calls it comeback dance. I call it as male combat or you know, two males fighting. I wouldn't call that as a dance. It's not a pleasure thing because they're fighting for the female. So I would like to change that into uh, male combat. You know, so my study site is Agumbe. I don't know how many of them been there where you are from. Agumbe is, is located in the central Western Ghats and has a very good uh, uh, population of king cobras. One very, very important reason for having good population there is people's uh, uh, patience. They don't kill king cobras there. So anytime there's a king cobra in the backyard, they call me, I go and rescue, either rescue or if there are male, female, I just 
stay there for a whole day or sometimes we have observed for 30 to 40 days and collect the data so that's one advantage but it's slowly disappearing there's a lot of uh, fragmentation happening but let's see cool so agumbe your central west western ghats you should know the western ghats is one of the eight uh, hottest biodiversity hotspots and it has high level of endemism like your lion tail macaw i don't know you guys are uh, aware this is found only in agumbe i mean in western ghats not not anywhere else and um, it covers close to 160,000 to 180,000 square kilometers and it's slowly disappearing good so my data collection was between 2007 to 2016 i know it's a pretty long uh, uh, number of years but uh, every year or once in two years we get this incident so i couldn't publish with very very little data now i have enough data to go ahead and publish and say something uh, you know uh, proper data i would say but most of the time the mating starts or uh, the mating behavior or courtship behavior everything is between february and may but the peak time is march and april that's the time the male, male combat and mating was observed in my study site cool cool so uh, how did we process the data and uh, we used jensen et al uh, as one of the main uh, paper um, so the behavioral events were modified little bit to our uh, requirement of whatever data we got it and also behavioral states for male combat were made if modified from carpenter et al again like i mentioned i also modified a lot of uh, text because like i said nowhere else was observed or recorded these courtship and behavior and of course you, you guys should read more of rick shine uh, papers he has done pretty uh, decent work in uh, australia so he was one of the person uh, whose papers i referred to cool so i would say we've observed close to nine instances of male combat uh, 12 inst- instances of courtship one instance of cannibalism i will talk about cannibalism soon and uh, four instances of bite when i say bite either male combat or courtship they they do not supposed to bite each other because they are venomous snakes and any small mistake either of them get killed so that's not the point here the point here is to uh, establish the territory and the males uh, if they win we call this win as a human term they get to mate right so if he loses the male has to leave the place so by killing each other or biting each other doesn't help both of them so males spend uh, more time guarding and courting with one female than going out to look for other females that's what we observed but yes sometimes they do disappear the males would disappear for one or two days uh, we still didn't figure out whether they this particular male has another female in a close proximity or he was just resting in another burrow and he appeared back after two or three days with the same field of semen so we still don't know about that so so one of the questions objective we think they are probably polyandry that is females do have more males and i think it's polygamous also where males will have many females okay so that is one thing we were little confirmed but we need more data definitely i don't know how many of them uh, what uh, male combat when i'm talking about male combat this is what the male combat is i hope uh, uh, you see is the video playing properly one of you can say yes please sir okay stop so what okay okay so that is that is this is a male typical male combat where one male is trying to press the other male's head or uh, a pin him down onto the floor look he's going to bite now there one bite that's it that's a very gentle bite but i wouldn't say that's a proper bite uh, this is the female and this is the male so what you see is two males fighting let's watch it again so these are two males fighting for the female okay female is very closely close but she's not watching them she doesn't need to watch them right look at this this is the female but she's not watching them there's two different shots uh, because who wins the match he will come back to mate with her so she doesn't care who won who lost whoever comes to her uh, is the winner 
So this is one incidence we had. So very beautiful shot we did. Uh, uh, this was in 2016. We were filming and we got uh, really nice data. And this male combat went on for almost 90 minutes. So that's really great. Good. Okay, next one. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> out of eight attempts of courtship, we think uh, the ma mating would have occurred five times. You know, so the duration is anywhere between 25 to 60 minutes because the courtship is very, very calm and slow. You know, they're just lying down and the female is receptive and very submissive uh, behavior, putting her body. Just watch this video again. Uh, so that, that's the female coming up and the, the top right, the one which is coming down is the male. You can see the size difference. The males grow up to 13, 14, 15, and female, look at that. That's a submissive behavior. She she spreads her hood, look at that, and coils around and puts her body under her, I mean, head under her body and goes round and round. I think this is very, very important for the male to know, okay, the female is submissive. She's ready to mate, but not to bite. So she is also convinced, okay, I will go further up and mate. If not, he should be careful so that he doesn't get bitten by the female. So most of the time, females are smaller, males are larger. This is called head butting. Very typical stimulating behavior, I think. The male is trying to tell the female, look, I just won the match or resting match. It's time for me for us to mate. And she coils around like that and slowly he will be uh, brave enough to do, I mean, go to the next uh, level of courtship that is mating, you know. If any miscommunication happens, one of them get bitten. So this is very interesting. In 2010, usually, like I mentioned now, there are two males, they fight for the female, and the loser leaves the place, and the winner goes to the female to communicate and uh, start the courtship and mating, right? That's the ritual. In 2010, we saw two males together under a haystack. And I was surprised to see even the female was inside. So this is the first incidence we saw where two males together sleeping under the haystack. I don't know whether they're sleeping very close by or two different corners, but uh, under the haystack. So this is one of, I think, very interesting uh, behavior. We need more data, but I think this this is this sounds really interesting for me at least. Good. So what is next? Okay, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, summarize all the. I put a lot of text here so that we don't forget, and I don't want to miss anything. But uh, with almost uh, eight years of work, uh, we think probably uh, they are the females are polyandry, and the uh, males did not go out looking for other females. Once in a while, I said they they disappeared. But most of the time, the male would stay on the female. When I say on the female, literally, uh, the male would sleep right on top of the female. If female moves from point A to point B, he would also go either lie down right next to her or on top of her so that he was very, very protective most of the time. And uh, whenever there is a new male, even up to about 10 or 15 meters, this guy would smell and dash in that direction and the male combat would start. So that was quite interesting we saw. And the other thing, uh, uh, males spend most of the time just courting and mating. And uh, I think somewhere we have mentioned, they never, or males, females both never thought about food and water. They just spend 90% of the time courting or mating, otherwise just resting. And of course, also I mentioned where they keep yawning. I don't know whether it's boredom. Of course, the researcher, we also used to yawn a lot because just watching them again and again and again, very few times they would just do something and most of the time they just rest. So, and also we figured out size does not play a role in male combat. I have seen when two males fighting, one one at one incident, I saw a younger female or a smaller male, at least 30 to 45 centimeters smaller than the bigger one, which used to win most of the time. The larger one would lose the match. So I, I, I decided size does not matter. Whoever is stronger or who have uh, more uh, energy 
I think they win it. Size does not matter. So, and also if you saw in the video approach, rearing up your vigilance, the female being very vigilant and displacement from player point A to point B and tongue flicking was a very, very important uh, behavior we observed and retreat. Of course, female retreating, coiling up, just settling down in one place, letting male to come investigate her and then uh, uh, continue with the courtship. This was observed, you know, and of course, yawning, I mentioned. And um, combat was observed to be prolonged and very vigorous in four cases, you know. Uh, I think uh, maybe the female was too close uh, to the males and they did realize that she's watching. She wasn't watching when I say um, possibly influence of presence of uh, female. You know, sometimes they, the male, uh, male combat happened quite a long distance also from the female. And we don't know still, yeah. So, <clears throat> like uh, out of eight, uh, mating occurred five times, which I mentioned already, I'm just summarizing here. So, the duration is anywhere between 25 to 60 minutes. And, uh, and also, I mentioned rare instance of both males taking refuge under the same uh, haystack and stayed with the female. So, that is. Uh, we never recorded that before. Not even with cobras or russells. We never seen that before. Yeah. So and cannibalism. I didn't mention in this uh, because there was only one incident where the male came and he did all the typical courtship behavior, and female was receptive, and suddenly he went to the neck and he caught her by the neck and pumped in venom and killed it, killed her right in front of us and started following her. There might be two reasons here. Uh, I would call that male as male E or male uh, uh, D. We don't know because there were several uh, courtship happening. The winner would have left or uh, he would have lost to this last male who was much, much stronger maybe. So he came, the new male came and he wanted to mate with the female, but it was already last leg of the courtship behavior or the mating period. The female was going through the shedding, right? You know, shedding, the ectasis, we call it as molting. She was not, she was, she was submissive and giving all the signal, but maybe she was not ready to mate because she's already mated and the eggs have already developed and uh, there's no way he can mate. So maybe he decided, oh, I've been under, I mean, hungry or mating with other females and not eating for 30, 45 days. If this female is not interested in mating, I will go ahead and eat her. So he did kill her, tried swallowing her. Almost uh, half of the body was inside his stomach and suddenly he regurgitated, meaning he puked, uh, puked her. He didn't, he didn't want to eat her. So we still don't know that occurred. Why did he come, kill the female, just tried swallowing and uh, he left the female and went. So this is quite interesting. I mentioned about this cannibalism behavior in another paper. I'll be happy to share uh, with you guys in case if you're interested, but we didn't put that here, the intraspecific behavior, because this was, that was only one incidence during between male and female. So cool. Um, that's the, that's all. These are the papers I referred. Thank you very much. I kept it very, very simple uh, so that we can have more of uh, interaction in case if you're keen. I mean, I, I'm open for the questions. That's all. Thank you, sir. Anybody? Yeah. Welcome. Over to the audience, uh, the participants, if you have any questions, clarifications, you can ask, sir. Yes. So very good afternoon, sir. Yes. So the, it was very interesting, and I Thank have you. a small uh, doubt, sir. Yes. So regarding cannibalism, you mentioned that uh, uh, the female was already mated with another male, and uh, uh, the eggs are already developed. Yes. Is there any cue for the male, other male, which is about to mate with the female? Is there any uh, cue from the female, sir? Uh, from the female, right? Yes, yes, sir. Um, yes, uh, like I said, uh, uh, one second, uh, your audio, is it clear now? Can I, can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I think I saw, like I mentioned, uh, she displayed uh, every single behavior there. But uh, uh, I think something would have gone wrong here. What we think is, have you seen lions doing this? Have you watched any video or read about lions when? Um, or a couple of males or one male goes and takes over one more pride. The old lion gets killed uh, by these new lions. So the, these lions have to mate with those uh, the new pride, right? The females. If the female has a couple of uh, cubs or three or four cubs, uh, those cubs belong to the previous uh, king or previous lions, right? Or the, the, uh, the pride king. So they don't want her to take care of them for another 12 months or 16 months. So they have want to mate. So they will kill the, the cubs because they doesn't belong to him or this new king. He will kill them so that the female comes back to the uh, mating uh, season or the heat and he will mate. So he wants her uh, progeny to come, not the old one. Or uh, uh, this is also uh, evolution or uh, a selection where... Uh, that the old lion might be too old and his offspring might fit to be in the wild. So he will kill. The new lion will kill. So this is one thing we discussed. Uh, but here we don't know what exactly happened. Uh, maybe he thought, look, this is not my female. These are not my uh, eggs or fertilized. I'm going to kill her. You know, maybe that would be one reason. So we still don't know. Arti, right? Who were asked? Ask, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank you, sir. Know. Thank you so much. Thank you. We don't know. We just so so much to <laughs> discover. So yeah. No, I thought some some pheromones or any other thing will be uh, secreted by the female that to express whether it was already mated and the egg was developing like exactly. that. Is there any uh, secretions? No, we don't know. No. Maybe. Oh. So the other oh, reason please. I said, if you don't remember, uh, she was shedding. She was already going through the molt, right? Shedding. You know. So this okay. happened yes. just oh. before. The female nests, nesting starts. So that means she'll finish her shedding. Then the next uh, uh, thing will be to build a nest. Days. So she was preparing. That means she was already carrying the eggs. And uh, uh, watch that video. It's called Secrets of King Cobra. I think it's there on online. Uh, in that, I do take the female and do an autopsy and check. There were 17 or 18 eggs already developed. Okay, so please do check that okay, video. Sir. Yes, sure, uh, sure, think... sir. Thank you so much. Somebody, Gita, uh, what is Gita Bali, yes. Yeah. What is the duration between mating and shedding? The the the, the interval. How long interval, after mating? Uh, see, uh, just starts? before the just before uh, the nesting starts, which is like April twenty second, twenty fifth is the exact date when they start was start uh, building the nest. The mating starts somewhere around, or somewhere around uh, March first week. So I would say 45 to 60 days is the time. Okay, I know that that girl asked a very relevant question in insects. Um, there is a there is a lot of uh, difference in the behavior of the uh, mm -hmm. female. It has a different posture. Yes. So these are all cues for the male to know it's no point uh, going to her. Uh, they know it. Assume a different posture, but I don't know invertebrates. Um, they don't have such a yeah. and some are we are yet to understand. Yes, thank you. Yet to understand. Uh, insects, you. yes, you're right. Uh, I, I I mentioned few, yeah, there is study on uh, lizards and few snakes, but with species like king cobra, we have zero data. Mm. Yeah, more yeah. to study, more to okay. understand them. Yes, uh, someone else, uh, Gita <laughs> Bali. Had, uh, I just spoke to you. Okay, okay. So we say what? Done. Anyone else? Doctor, there are no more uh, questions and clarifications. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jashankar, for inviting. Thank you for accepting and being here, sharing uh, very important views, new concepts, uh, the species concept itself. Uh, yes, very, very informative. Uh, a, a big paradigm shift. Yeah, thank yes. you for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Have sir. a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of all the plenary uh, talks. 
and uh, the last uh, segment is the info poster presentation and uh, for that to chair we have dr shubha from bms college for women's uh, bengaluru uh, madam will take over and all the info poster presentations will be completed in this session and also if there were any pending oral poster presentations that could also be included here to finish and give a complete uh, closure to all the presentations and then we'll take on with the start on with the valedictory and wind up the two day national conference on uh, recent trends in animal behavior 44th annual one by bsi in association with the national science association department of zoology st joseph's college over to dr shubha and i also want to know uh, dr baskaran from Madurai um, is also here. Okay, okay. I don't know why you need to make it nice, but I am doing a lot more. Okay, okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay, Dr. Baskaran also joined this chairing uh, with uh, Dr. Shubha. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta is uh, not ready to join. So you can share this session. Over to Dr. Shubha. I'll read out the info poster presenters. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, madam. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, uh, all the participants. I welcome for the info poster presentation. So, could I, uh, who, who will read out the list, sir? I will read out, ma'am. I'll uh, help you in that. Okay. Uh, participants are here. Please uh, give an S for if you are present here. Kavyashri, symbiotic relationship between flora and fauna. Yes, sir. Natalia Rajkova, sexual cannibalism among animals. Yes, sir. Uh, bird migration uh, was completed yesterday. Suraj has completed. No problem. Human sloth bear conflict, Kaushik. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, then we have Abhishek and Manjari Prasad. This is not your title. It is mixed up, correct? Uh, Abhishek, yeah. what's your title? Uh, Birds of Paradise, Beauty Kings. Okay, both of you are here. Uh, Sneha Karan, Sheetal, Melita, Druti, imprinting in ducks. Any one of you? Sneha, Sheetal, Druti, okay. Uh, that goes into an yellow mark. Okay, we'll wait for them to respond. Then Alhan Nawaz, courtship in Sara screens. Kiran Sai Kumar. Yes, okay, Alhan Nawaz is here. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, just a reminder you're related to uh, Professor Atas. Sir, I didn't get you. Uh, I'm told you're related of uh, Professor Atas, Ramat Atas. So, uh, Alan won't be uh, attending it. Okay, I am his friend. Okay, okay, the other okay, okay, okay. Good job. And on guard, uh, Ruben Marina Lobo. Ruben? Here, we are not able to hear. Uh, then Anukriti Shah. Anukriti. But they all said they'll be joining. I think there is a waiting in the lobby. Okay. Anukriti is there to join. Okay. Anjusha, parental care in fishes. Anjusha, Nandini, Nivedita, Tejas. Okay. Unique characteristics of lobster. Varshini? Uh, sir, present, sir. Okay. Stress hormones, stress and hormones. Pushpendra Singh? Present. Okay. We'll lose more. Three minutes only. Please stick to the time. The chairperson will suggest. Apur Sharma, study of emotional intelligence in elephants. Yes, sir. We are here. Yes, sir. There are four authors for that. Okay. And Pratiksha for behavior of cats. Nobody for behavior of cats. Okay. Unique characteristics of lobster is getting repeated. Okay. And uh, then we have. Uh, Anukriti Shah is also getting repeated. So that's all, uh, Dr. Shubha. You can go ahead uh, calling out the names. The first one is Kavya Shri. Yes, madam. 
Is my screen visible, sir? No. No, no, come. Good evening, one and all. This is Kavya Shri here from Bangalore. My topic is symbiotic relationship between flora and fauna. As we all know, symbiosis is a, a mutualistic relationship between uh, of biological interaction between any two biological organisms. Coming to the brief introduction, they are of different types, which includes mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, and competition. Uh, mutualism is a type of relationship in which both the organisms are benefited. Uh, for example, uh, this relationship includes the re interaction between acacia species and ants. Uh, commensalism is also a type of uh, symbiotic relationship in which one, org one organism is benefited and the other is neither benefited nor harmed. Uh, the next one is the parasitism. In this type of relationship, one organism called parasite leaves on the host or inside the host and causes harm to the host. Human pathogens are an example for parasitism. Uh, coming to the same symbiotic relationship between uh, Leonotus, uh, Leonurus, and uh, sunbirds. Uh, these birds have perfectly evolved curved beak, which fits inside the trumpet shaped flowers of Leonotus, Leonurus. Uh, these flowers are usually orange or red colored because sunbirds are attracted to orange or red colored flowers. In return, these Leonotus leonurus provide nectar in return. So this is a symbiotic relationship. Uh, the next one is the, the most common type of symbiotic relationship is that of Acrea butterfly and wild peach. A uh, wild peach is evolved to produce uh, to produce leaves after areca larvae have eaten it. In return, these caterpillars provide fertilizer for the trees. Uh, garden areca also provide food for the insect eating birds. Uh, coming to the next one, it is the commensalism relationship between the Cape Parrot and Afrocarpus falcatus. Uh, Cape Parrot is a South Africa's endemic parrot. These, uh, these Cape Parrots are physiologically and behaviorally evolved so that uh, they depend complete. They, de they are dependent completely, completely on Afrocarpus falcatus for food and breeding. So this is a commensalism relationship wherein these cape parrots are benefited, by while the tree, uh, the tree Afrocarpus falcatus is neither benefited nor harmed. Uh, the next one is the relationship between the sugar bird and Proteaceae. Uh, sugar birds plays an important important role in pollinating Protea flowers. Uh, these sugar birds have evolved to have extra long claws so that it can be able to grip or hold the protea heads in strong winds and help and therefore help in the pollination of uh, protea flowers. Uh, coming to the next one is the obligate mutualism, mutualism relationship between South African fig trees and fig wasp. Uh, in these fig trees and fig wasps, uh, it is a obligate obligatory mutualism wherein both the organisms cannot live without each other they can't lead independent life the trees rely on the wasp for pollen dispersal and pollination while the wasp can only reproduce in the florets of a fig fruit uh, this was the brief uh, note on uh, symbiotic relationship between flora and fauna thank you i would like to thank you uh, shubha ma'am and jai shankar sir for the opportunity thank you all Thank, thank you, Kavishri. It was a wonderful uh, information you have gathered. Uh, shall we move on to the second participant? Natalia Rajkova. Yes, sir. So, good afternoon. Good evening to one and all present here. Uh, so 
Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. You can proceed. So my topic was sexual cannibalism among animals. So sexual cannibalism is the behavior in which the female divorce are made after copulation. This is basically a behavioral practice which is mainly documented among insects and arachnids. The main purpose for sexual cannibalism is not uh, really unknown, but uh, uh, the, some of the reasons given by the researchers are adaptive forging, aggressive spillover, and mistaken of identity. The adaptive forging is when an animal is unable to find food when it needs or wants, and immediately based on the certain behavior, they will turn to sexual cannibalism. Or aggressive spillover, which is unlike uh, uh, adaptive forging, is when an animal aggressively seeks food, and it occurs when a female are genetically inclined to and hostile towards the prey and the males. Mistaken identity is when animals cannot differentiate between members of opposite sexes or if they are a part of the same species. And some of the animals that practice sexual cannibalism are the famously known black widow spider, which actually got its name due to, the pra due to this particular practice, in which after mating, the male in this case actually presents himself to the female as a feast. Then another one is the St. Andrew's cross spider in which the male actually tries to escape after mating. However, sometimes uh, they are successful and sometimes they end up being the food for the female. Then another of the animals is the green anaconda in which uh, the female, which is much larger than the male, divorced the male after basically um, copulating with the uh, with him and this is actually not a very common practice in these animals however if sometimes the uh, female wants the nutrition she is going to eat the eat her meat then another one is the octopus and uh, which the females generally strangles the male and then would take him take the carcass of the male to a place where she can peacefully eat it. This is again not a very common practice among the octopuses. However, sometimes if the female needs the nutrition, then she will eat him. Then another uh, of the animals are, is the praying mantis. Uh, in this case, however, the sexual cannibalism actually takes place because it is said that by eating up the male, the clutch size of a female increases and therefore increasing the chances of the survival. The same case goes for the dark fishing spider in which also uh, the clutch size increases as the female the eats her meat. So that was my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Um, can I call the third participant? Yes, ma'am. Morning, uh, there was a poster presentation that missed. Danushri is here. Uh, yes, sir. Please share. Proceed. Uh, chairperson's note, this is a poster presentation. Uh, yeah, info way. poster, no, sir. Uh, no, no, no. Yes. Just give me a minute time. Meanwhile, I'll just uh, prepare. So just give me one minute time. So I think one other person can take over and I'll go next. Sir. Is that OK? OK, uh, with the permission of the chair, both of you, I'll call upon Kaushik for human cloth bear conflict. Kaushik, over to Yes, sir. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, you can proceed. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to all the dignitaries present today. I'm Kaushik S, a student of the BBZ batch at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. And today I'm here to speak on an issue which has affected the Indian population for more than five centuries. That is the conflict between human, homo sapien and the sloth bear, Melosus ursinus. As you can see from the poster, we have the map 
of our country india which shows us the habitat range of the sloth bear the white colored areas represent the total overlay of where the sloth bears are least commonly seen while the red and green while the red and green colored areas mark the areas where their range overlays and going on to the talk going on to my topic about human sloth bear conflict it is one of the most serious issues that has ever take that has ever occurred in our country because more than 1000 people are injured in this conflict and as a result of this conflict more than 50% of all the bear, bear of all the bears are wiped out in the form of re- in the form of revenge killing which in turn reduces the number of bears pe- of the bears uh, of the bears which are alive right now and there are three major reasons why this conflict can be seen in a day to day basis number 1 is the decreasing habitat of the bear and number 2 we can see man always encroaching the areas where these bears are found and finally uh, the third reason is for livelihood as in the case of the kalandar tribe of rajasthan we can see the barbaric act of uh, we can see the barbaric act of dancing bears where bears are taken away from them bear cubs are taken away from their mothers at a very young age and pressurized by people to perform for others by uh, with the, uh, when people apply uh, apply hot metal nooses on to their skin so that the bear can jump out of pain and these acts are referred to as dancing we can see a dead bear carcass being dragged from a pickup truck and that is the bear carcass of a male cub that has just died due to the barbaric act of bear dancing and also the uh, compared to all the other bear species found in india the sloth bear is most commonly seen out of all the bears because of which uh, more than 3 300 people in the state of karnataka comes in conflict with these species uh, in the year 2014 almost 30 people were severely injured in this conflict between man and bear so uh, as a result whenever uh, as a precaution we can always uh, we can always avoid traveling when it's dark walking in group making noises playing dead in a protective position so that the bear cannot atta- attack us when our face is down to the ground and it also helps us in promoting the in protecting our vital organs thank you thank you doshi tanushree yes yes sir uh, just one minute so is my screen visible yes yes no sorry go ahead yes. so good good evening everyone today i am presenting a poster presentation on animal communication uh, this is dhanushri from reva university so basically communication is when animal transmits information to another animal causing some kind of change in the animal that gets the information so right uh, communication is usually between animals of a single species 
but it can also happen between two animals or even two different species as well. So animals communicate using signals, uh, which includes four main signals that is visual, auditory or sound based, chemical involving pheromones or tactile that is touch based cues. So communication behaviors can help animals find their mates for reproduction, establish dominance, defend territory, coordinate group behavior and care for the young, young ones. So this poster basically involves all uh, different types of animals. They are in interacting with each other in their own cues. So have they ever wondered how ants follow the uh, seem to be visible trails leading to food? So why does a male dogs mark their territory by peeing on bushes and lap, um, lampposts when you take them for a walk? What birds are saying to one another when they chirp outside your window? So these are all some of the questions that raise up when we talk about the animal behavior. So communication when we are talking about animal behavior can be any process where information is passed from one animal to another causing a change or response in the receiving animal. Um, OK, what forms the communication behaviors take? Uh, well, the animal sensory systems vary quite a great deal. For instance, dogs smell, uh, dog, uh, dog sense the smell, isn't it? So it is 40 times more accurate than what we smell. That is what we humans smell. Because of this sensory diversity, animals, uh, different animals communicate using a wide range of stimuli known as signals. So pheromones, these are the chemicals. Auditory cues are the sounds visual cues and tactile cues, that is the touch. Uh, so in, in the rest of the um, pheromones, uh, in knowing about pheromones, it is a secreted chemical signal used to trigger a response in another individual of the same species. So this uh, pheromones cannot act, uh, cannot act with while communicating with another species. So pheromones may attract the opposite sex, raise an alarm, mark a foot trail or trigger other more complex behaviors. So, um, here in the poster, I have showed some examples wherein brightly colored throat flap of a male green annual uh, communicates using its using its visual property. Mating cell of northern cardinal uh, communicates using its auditory. Chemical signaling in Asian elephant detected by a vermirinocin organ that communicates using its chemical properties. Whereas uh, then use of internal uh, line system in schooling fish um, uh, communicates using its mechanosensors. So again, uh, in the same way, there are various things like the fireflies go glow to attract mates, and this is the form of reproduction that they uh, attract. Usually, there are uh, like colorful fe colorful feathers on the peacocks, right? So that is the attraction for the male uh, for the opposite sex to mate. So elephants trunks to talk to another uh, herds over long distances. So dogs stick their pumps to bond clean and stimulate their development. So yes, these are some of the uh, communication behaviors that I have tried taken it, taking here. So thank you, thank you one and all for giving me this opportunity to present my poster presentation. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dhanushri. So next participant is ready. Abhishek. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Manjali, can you uh, share the poster? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a minute. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Abhishek Mishra and with me Manjari Prasad. We are second year BSc CBZ student at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. Here we are presenting the topic Birds of Paradise, Beauty, Beauty King. Through the poster, we want to draw your attention towards the courtship and the breeding behavior that made that male birds of the paradise had developed to attract the female partner. The birds of paradise belong to the family Paradidaceae with almost 45 species and are well known about their beauty. Let's see with some example that what are the characters male bird develop to communicate and to attract the female bird partner. So first example is of greater Laforina. The male greater Laforina has a two erectile fans we, which are lifted up over the head during its display. They, um, they have metallic blue-green breast shield, which 
they display during the courtship to attract the female butt partner. Second example is the Wilson Bird of Paradise. Male has a bottle green chest, red back, and yellow on the back of the neck, all or which it, it can erect into an elaborate ornamentation during the display to attract the female butt partner. Males also give a series of loud pew calls. The third example is of magnificent rifle bird. Males are mostly black with bright metallic blue chest and crown and shaggy black fang plumes, which they display during the courtship to attract the female partner. The call in a very three note visual praise, similar to the visual humans used to say. Fourth example is of the sickle whale. Male is mainly black and have a very long tail. Male does the attractive display where two articulate fans are lifted above the head and whole body is swayed up and down. These all help the male to come to attract and communicate with the female bird. Male voice call has a two sets of explosive hollowed double notes. The fifth example is of Ragaina bird of paradise. Males have a red or orange plumes which are raised above the back during the display in which he leans forward and flicks his wings. He gives a repeated nasal quack as a voice call to attract the female bird. These are some examples through which we can understand the characteristic that males has to attract the female for the breeding. Now the most important part is how male bird of paradise has developed such character of display, dance, voice call to communicate with the female partner. So the reason is the testosterone hormone present in the males due to which they have such character. But if we talk about how they have evolved, then the answer is due to the theory of the sexual selection. Thank you so much, Manjari, for the coordination with me for the info poster presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, the next in line next. is Neha Karen, uh, imprinting in ducks. If they are not there, we go to courtship in Sarah screens. Courtship in Sarah screen from Indian Academy Degree College. Alhan Nawaz, Kiran K, Sai Kumar, Yatish. Yeah, please share. Can I add this, sir? Yeah. Daphne, one thing. One second, sir. Sir, I'm having a problem. Can I uh, discreet at the last, sir? Let's try to Mr. Ramesh Kumar, your PPT has no. not yet come. Uh, B. Milanahi, uh, did you mail it? Sir, I mail it, sir. It has not yet come, sir. SJC, NSA, we have not received. Okay, sir. sir Please try. I send it again, sir. Yeah, please, please try and check, check the mail ID properly and send. I will share and you can present. Okay, uh, Ruben, you're ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, for the information of the chair, this is Ruben Marina Lobo. She's going to speak on hands on guard. Sir, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yeah. But the uh, actual person is not in this world. Blank screen. Yeah. yeah. Hello? Yes, Ruba. Sir, are you able to hear my, uh, see my screen? Yeah, you saw it. 
but uh, the actual presentation is not in this one. Uh, okay. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, Sir, move to the next one. Uh, Ruben, you are not able to present? Yeah. Yeah, she's sharing. Yeah, ah, yes. Okay. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay, there was some uh, audio problem happening that time. So, so, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. I'm Rubin Marina Lobo, currently pursuing my master's in zoology in Bangalore University. And I would like to talk about uh, the defense in ants, that's the ants on guard. So mainly the defense in the ants is not just for the self-defense, it's for the betterment of the entire colony. So today I want to talk about, about the Anocetus, Odontomachus, and Polyrachis, Crematogaster, Ecophila, and Colobopsis ants. So Anocetus and Odontomachus are one such genus which are very closely related, but they're very uh, similar looking ants. The jaws uh, are open at 180 degree angle. So whenever there's a possible prey which comes and attacks or uh, uh, if there's a prey which touches the tentacles under the mandibles so their jaws snap shut and they ripple back so this is so at that lightning speed they uh, uh, jaw shut and because of that lightning shut the ants tend to jump over, over 8.3 centimeter in odontomachus and few inches in anocetus so this type of prey catching strategy where they jump is also used as a defense. So when there's a predator, the jaws snap and the ants jump to a certain uh, safe uh, place and escape from the predator. So it's very similar strategy in both Anocetus and Odontomachus. And Anocetus is also known to feign dead, like the act dead when there's a predator nearby. Then I want to talk about this Polyrachis genus. Polyrachis is also called as fish hook ants, and they're very uh, popular for the hook like structure on the petiole, uh, which looks like a fish hook. And so it's uh, popularly called as fish hook ants. Now, workers have a pair of large hook like spines on the petiole, uh, that, that is, uh, which look like a fish hook, and that's why it's called as fish hook. Then when a predator approaches their nest, ants will swarm thousands at a time, hook onto each other using their spines and link them to each other. So it's difficult for the predator to separate them. And when the predator engulfs these uh, ants, the entire swarm gets into their mouth. And because of these spines, they slit their throat and tongue, causing dis discomfort for the uh, predator. And because of some internal bleeding, the predator might feel discomfort and leave the colony and go away. So again, in ants, you see it, it, the sacrificing is mainly because of their colony and they wouldn't think about them uh, in front of their colony. And then next we move on to the Crematogaster genus. So also called as cocktail ants, acrobat ants, and even St. Valentin ants. Uh, cocktail ants because of their raised abdomen, as you can see in this uh, image. So when there's a predator nearby, they are known to uh, squirt venom uh, from the tip of their gaster into the predator. So the venom is a toxic substance. So when there's any wound on the predator, so this venom causes discomfort to the predator and it uh, leaves the colony and uh, moves away. And next, uh, I would like to talk about Ecophila. The behavior of this Ecophila is very uh, familiar to Crematogaster. So when the invaders are spotted by the ant, it releases pheromones, which call uh, the alums pheromones, and it calls a thousand other uh, ant mates. And in no time, the colony mates join in for the battle. And they even use their mandibles on their predator. So once that is not successful enough, these ants again uh, squirt formic acid just like Crematogaster. 
so formic acid when dropped on the wound of these uh, predators it causes irritation uh, for the predator and then eventually even they uh, leave the colony and go away a ecophila is one of the worst invasive ant species because of this defensive character next is uh, colobopsis explodens colobopsis explodens is not found in india whereas all the other genus are found in india this is found in the indo uh, australian region this is a special land where it is known to burst their abdomen when there's a, a predator nearby uh, because of this uh, bursting of uh, the abdomen it releases a uh, yellow color sticky goo onto the predator again which has a toxic substance which when fall on the predator gives irritation uh, to the predator and then eventually even it drives the predator away from the colony and uh, protects its next generation uh, yeah it's almost time it's already time yeah uh, yeah so by this i i would like to stop sure. uh, if i finished it good okay thank, thank you, you so much for giving me this opportunity Thank you, thank you, Ravi. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Who's the next one? Yeah, to the chair's reference, uh, Mr. Ramesh Kumar is here. Ramesh, hello. Ramesh Kumar, are you present? Okay, it's not available. Uh, Edvendran, are you ready? Indian Academy is on screen. Mr. Ramesh Kumar is here. Can you hear me? Not responding, sir. No. Uh, his name can be seen. Yeah. 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 Send the PP to my mail ID. I am ready to share. Uh, anyway, Edvendra is also not ready. Indian Academy. Yes, not sir. One. Ready. One. Minute. you only have 3 minutes overall to present so one minute goes yes. into technical uh just check edwin drive it's happening fine if not uh, we will move on to the next speaker is mr ramesh kumar uh, attempting to speak uh, we are yes, not sir. yes sir i present sir okay that's yes, fine Yeah, this information to the chair that uh, Mr. Yes. Ramesh Kumar wants to do the oral presentation. It was scheduled yesterday, but uh, he is planning to do today due to technical glitches and problem with the internet. Hi, Pariyam sir. Uh, can yeah, you see yeah. the slide, sir? Ramesh Kumar sir, can you see the slide? Sir, yeah, I present, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. If you are okay, you keep telling me. I will uh, change the title. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's your uh, synopsis. Okay, proceed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ha. Yes, sir. Move ahead. Yes. Proceed, sir. Yes, sir. Start, sir. The of the diversity of. A study of diversity of benthic fauna and fish, fishes of the Koshi River. A special research of the flood season. The enhance of the sediment in the based on the of organic occurrence of the. benthic soil rivers substra of the different size of the prevent uh, mr ramesh kumar the, you can avoid the introduction you can go to the finding uh, what you have sir, I, uh, is your objective sir, I, ramesh yeah tell about your objective and findings introduction will avoid skip okay yes i ramesh kumar The observer, observer of the hydrological para, parameters of the selected site of the Koshi River near Navatra block. The 
product of the diversity is the benthic fauna and the species of the estuary area. The essays of the ecological importance of the benthic fauna and the species of the selected sites. Okay, sir. Yes. There may be some limits, limitations of which are the following. The sur survey work of the Koshi River near the block Navata Saharsa district only for 4 kilometers will be confined of the meet the objectives. There may be times constant since the survey is the provided to the completed in the limit period of the time within two years. Internal and external influence the condition may be faced during the data collection in the May recreated. The procedure study will be carried on the following technique. Can you please show us the results, right? Yeah. I think he has some network problem. So better we can see I the results. I believe it's some synopsis. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Such. Can you tell about your result findings, sir? Only about your findings. Still now, whatever you have done, what is the findings of your study? Can you tell in few lines? That's sufficient. Yes, sir. The diversity of the fish fauna. This chapter will be detail the diversity of fish fauna in the all the season in the study area. Result and discussion is the will detail all the findings with the season on facts, conclusion and recommendation. In the will express the major finding along with the some suggestion recommendation of the conservation of the aquatic fauna reference of this chapter will be okay okay thank you thank you very much good supervisor sir dr manoj so thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much thank you okay sir okay. anukriti shaw is here anukriti Anjukriti is not there. Anjusha, Anjusha. How many more papers are there, Jay Shankar? Another Sir, three more. Sir. Three more. Three more. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Then we'll Sir. start with the valedictory. Anjusha is here. Sir, Anukriti is present. Sir. Yeah, Anukriti, please uh, proceed. Um, I'll be present. Okay. Anukriti, yeah. Uh, guys, I got to rush through so that uh, we can end up and uh, prepare the Christmas Eve. Uh, sir, I'm going to present it. Just let me know if you can share or uh, see my screen. Unshared mine, you should be able to share now. Okay. okay sir. Uh, Mr. Ramesh Kumar, you can turn off your uh, camera, video, you can close the camera. Yeah. Anukriti, you can share. Yes, it's getting shared. Thank you. Uh, can you see it? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. My info poster is on parental care of primates. Uh, it is a phylogenetic tree representation of evolution of parental care in primates. So, um, parental care is a very energetically expensive trait that is uh, uh, that is an innate behavior in a lot of um, mammals and animals. Uh, Parental care is an evolutionary uh, behavioral strategy that is uh, expressed by animals to take the generations forward. Uh, now it is expressed by um, maternal. Uh, it is uh, there are uh, three forms of parental care uh, like maternal care, paternal care, and alloparental care. Now obviously maternal care is uh, the care of the mother, paternal care is the care of the father, and alloparental care, however, is a very interesting behavior that is seen in uh, primates especially, uh, which is provided by the fellow members of the group. 
So uh, phylogenetic uh, tree was constructed for this study uh, in Nexus 10K format, and uh, through this, uh, the, the data was uh, the data was uh, you know uh, collected in Excel, and uh, a phylogenetic tree was made using R programming. So uh, through this tree, we see the contrasting difference. Uh, here's the tree. If you can see, I'll just zoom into it. Uh, so uh, through this tree, you can see that uh, there uh, uh, there is uh, one side there's paternal care and the other side there's uh, parental care. Uh, we observe that in some old world monkeys uh, called Caterini, the trait of parental uh, the paternal care was lost in the course of evolution. While in Platyrini, the par uh, paternal care remained in the course of evolution. Also, uh, in uh, some monkeys. Uh, in some primates, especially uh, social organization, seem to uh, play a major part in the expression of uh, these uh, parental care traits. Uh, so, uh, pa uh, parental care is also controlled by hu uh, by hormones, uh, which is greatly and uh, uh, despite uh, it being greatly influenced by the environment. Uh, the primate leave, uh, lives in, uh, hormones also play an important role. Hormones like uh, vasopressin, oxytocin, testosterone, prolactin are uh, uh, you are, are seen in the uh, you know expression of this behavior. Also, uh, mostly uh, in monogamous relationships of primates, uh, paternal care is uh, evident and uh, there is absence of uh, alloparental care, but in uh, multi females and single male uh, structures of the society of the uh, societal organization, uh, there is absence of paternal care and presence of alloparental care. But uh, in mul uh, but in fission fusion groups like uh, the chimpanzees and gibbons, there is presence of uh, both alloparental care and paternal care. Uh, so uh, this uh, tree was made using the uh, R programming, uh, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, parental care is, uh, like I said, a very energetically expensive trait, and uh, it seems to keep evolving with time. And uh, due to less exploration of this field, uh, a lot of uh, data remains quite unavail uh, unavailable, which is uh, also seen in the tree because uh, here a lot of data seems unavail uh, unavailable. So we are not able to, you know, uh, express uh, uh, express the whole chart properly. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next um, question, uh, yeah. Anjusha, Anjusha, Nandini team, anybody here? Yes, sir. Okay, please proceed. Parental care and fishes. Yes, sir. Yes. So is my screen visible? No, not yet. So now, yeah, now it's okay. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Today I'll be talking about parental care in fishes. So, has Anupriti spoke about parental care in primates? So, most of the times we are um, concentrating on parental care that is seen in case of mammals like dogs, fishes, or I mean dogs, cats, humans, and etc. But uh, we do have parental care that is seen in the wild. Uh, so best example of it could be seen uh, that's seen in fishes. So I'll directly move into the examples. So I want to talk about three examples today. The first thing is the African um, chicklets. So the African chicklets are uh, mouth brooders, which basically have a cavity within their mouth, which stores the eggs. And once the fishes, uh, I mean, the once the fertilized eggs are hatched, 
the young ones uh, swim near the maternal's uh, mouth so that they are not carried away uh, in the current in the water currents or uh, neither are they prone to any predators uh, and during this course of time where the maternal uh, is protecting its uh, young ones uh, it does not eat anything um, so that is one of the important trait which is seen in the chicklets and uh, secondly sea horses or the hippocampus so as most of us know uh, in case of hippocampus it is a male who takes care of the young ones and uh, so the male uh, basically uh, gives all nutrition the oxygen prolactin and uh, other important uh, protection that is required for the young ones during the season of breeding and uh, even um, before the young ones are released into the sea water it uh, helps in osmo regulating the young ones so that uh, they wouldn't have any problems swimming out in the sea water and uh, finally we have the stickleback fishes so the stickleback fishes um, shows two main characteristics first is the courtship with the female and secondly the parental care uh, the stickleback fishes they uh, build their own nests in a proper suitable place and uh, once they court the female the female lays its eggs and then which is later fertilized by the male and um, the male makes sure that uh, the nest is protected at all costs and it also aerates the nest by swimming around it and it also makes sure that there is no any predator around the nest area. Um, so uh, lastly the clownfish, again clownfish falls under the category where it protects all its young ones uh, in a particular safe area. Uh, and that's all about it. And uh, I mainly wanted to uh, draw attention towards two uh, things through this parental care. First of all, um, parental care itself is an energy cost process. It requires a lot of energy for the fishes to do all of this uh, behavior, but still it is done across all species uh, within all of these organisms, uh, irrespective of all odds that's present out there in the wild. And secondly, uh, to make all this happen, the fishes itself have to undergo a lot of modifications and uh, these modifications do not happen overnight. It has to undergo it, it has to undergo a lot of uh, processes through the course of evolution. So it also talks about uh, the evolution changes that has taken place in the fishes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mandisa. I believe unique characteristics of lobster by Varshini was done already. Varshini? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, please share. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I hope my screen is visible. No. Uh, just a minute. Is the screen visible? Yes, uh, actually, well, your device was uh, shared it, but the exact uh, post is not yet visible. So now? No. So the entire screen was shared. Yeah. Uh, yes. Now it is working. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Myself, Varshini. I'm pursuing my uh, biotechnology at Reva MSc Biotechnology at Reva University. Uh, today, my topic is unique characteristics of lobster. Lobsters are the invertebrates, a dark colored marine crustacean. They're also bluish green or greenish brown in color. And uh, these are 25 to 50 centimeter long omnivores. They typically eat live prey fish such as uh, molluscans and other crustaceans as well. And um, coming to the classification, they belong to the phylum Arthropoda, class Malacostraca, order Decapoda, and family Nephrophidae. The scientific name of lobster is Nephrophidae. Personally, your slides are not, uh, it's not moving. Um, 
It is uh, still in our title slide. Okay, sir. So is it? No, it's new. Oh. Yeah. How do you see it? Uh, can I just proceed like this? Okay. But no, so no. Ah, now it is working. Yeah. You can go here. Yeah. Yeah, coming to the body structure and adaptation lobster have a rigid segmented body covering called exoskeleton it has a five pairs of legs where one pair is modified into spencers the lobsters have compound eyes that are adapted for the low light environment this is ideal since lobsters inhabit deep water where little light is present and normally to hunt at night and lobsters have two antenna that are covered in tiny hairs that pick up chemicals for potential predators or prey and relate them back to the lobsters so that the animal can literally smell its surroundings. And lobsters also have a developed pair of claws that are distinct to one another. One claw is larger with tiny teeth on it. The other lobster uses to grab or hold and crush its prey. The other claw is smaller with serrated edges that is used to cut. The lobsters have an ability to shed its outer skin through the process called molting that allows the animal to regenerate its lost limbs. And coming to the unique characteristics, coming to the unique characteristics of lobster, the first is it is immortal. The lobsters are biologically immortal. Lobsters don't age, they don't get weaker or lose their ability to reproduce and will keep on molting and growing. However, it doesn't mean that they, uh, they live forever. At some point, even if they aren't caught, they die due to natural causes. And the second, coming to the excretion, all lobsters excrete from the openings that is ne called nephrophores, that is located at the base of its second antenna. These excretory organs are called green glands and include a sac linked to a bladder by a coiled tube. And coming to the regeneration of limb. Lobsters have a large claw called crusher and a smaller, smaller one called scissor. A claw will grow when it undergo a molting and molting happens several times in a year until a lobster is fully sized adult. It's going to take probably a five year for a one pound lobster to regenerate a claw that's about the same size of the one that was lost. Faced with their legs. The lobsters have a chemosensory leg and a feet hairs to identify food. When consuming prey, the hairs on the lobster's front walking leg allow them to taste the food. And yeah, lobsters cannot undergo shock. When other animals, including humans, uh, you know, we experience extreme pain and a nervous nervous system may shut down as a looping mechanism. Lobster and other crustaceans don't have an ability to go into shock. So when they are exposed to a crucial procedures like uh, being boiled alive, you know, the suffering is prolonged. And lobsters kill each other. Lobsters are known to attack or eat each other in captivity as 
you know as uh, it is seen in the picture when the lobsters are kept together in captivity their claws are secured with rubber bands to prevent this coming to the reproduction part the lobsters you know the female breed every two year once and the male will deposit a packet of sperm on the underside of the female and the female will be later used to sperm excretory fertilizer eggs as they are laid after the male and the female produces a thousands of eggs that is stay attached and the swim rates of approximately one year after this period the eggs drop and hatch and the surviving larva begin their lives as a little shrimp like creatures and they swim around approximately one year and eating plankton and molting or shedding their exoskeleton this crosses they complete about 15 times before they drop in the bottom and begin their adult lives coming uh, lobsters have a very good as it is a very rich in nutrition like it's a low calorific food and it is rich in omega 3 fatty acids it has a um, many health benefits it improves heart health uh, like heart diseases is a leading cause for the death around the world and studies suggest that eating foods with omega 3 fatty acid at least once in a week can significantly reduce the risk of developing heart diseases yeah okay thank you rosni So thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. The next speaker is Dr. Pushpendra Singh. Stress and hormones. Are you there, sir? Pushpendra Singh. Pushpendra Singh. Okay, Pushpendra Singh is not here. Study of emotional intelligence in elephants. Apur Sharma and team. Can you go ahead? Are you here? Yes, sir. We are here. Yeah. Please proceed. Sneha, can you please share the screen? Yeah, one second. Is it visible? Yeah, visible. Uh, good morning. Good good evening, everyone. I'm Shiksha Dukani, and I'm going to speak about emotional intelligence in elephants on behalf of my group. Expression of wide variety of emotions by elephants is a proof of their high emotional intelligence and their wit and self awareness. Joy, anger, grief, compassion, and love are some of the finest emotions that reside within these hulking masses. <laughs> elephants are considered to be one of the world's most loving and empathetic species. they show empathy not only towards their kind but for others as well this includes comforting grieving and even rescuing each other from harm at their own expense in kenya researchers have watched mother elephants and other adult females help baby elephants climb up muddy banks and out of holes find a safe path into a swamp or break through electrified fences On the least occasion, researchers have watched an elephant struggle to help a dying friend, lifting her with the tusks and trunk while calling out in distress. Elephants also help their injured fellows by spraying dust on their wounds and plucking out tranquilizing darts. Competitive emotion in elephants is also quite prominent. They usually apply a fight back mitigation strategy as a sanction when competition initiators are low ranking or when they are or when they are a close affiliation but are submissive if the initiators are high ranking or are not closely affiliated. Elephants know envy and jealousy. They can throw tantrums and harbor grudges about a perceived injustice just like a human child elephants also show compassion and altruism the one event that stirs a level of elephant happiness beyond compare is the birth of a baby elephant in echo an elephant to remember the birth of ebony is one such occasion the excitement of several females in echo's family cannot be contained as they are heard bellowing and blaring during the <clears throat> during the birth of the new baby 
in an incident in west bengal in 2019 an elephant shielded a 4 year old girl from the rest of the herd the girl was traveling with her parents on a two wheeler ridden by her father when the herd of elephants suddenly appeared from a forested patch on the road he lost his balance and crashed the vehicle one of the elephants from the group walked towards the toddler and stood still on <laughs> between between its legs uh, protecting it from the other from the herd to conclude elephants are capable of expressing their emotions just like humans thank you thank you thank you sir uh, okay the last group present tiksha umesh sangal behavior of cats are uh, present okay now if there are anybody uh, who couldn't uh, present this is the last option you can make your attempt if not who is this ah uh, yadavendra yeah yeah indian academy yeah you were uh, you had technical issue yeah go ahead please are you able to see sir no now sir mm, not it now sir yeah i think yeah but uh, can you uh, can you turn the file uh, actually it is in a I think this is last one, doctors. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Edvendra, is there a technical glitch? Are you able to share? Yeah, it's, it's getting sir. shared. Yes, yes. Yeah, good. Yes. Uh, shall I start now? Yeah, sure. You can start, Yadavendra. Yadavendra. Good evening, all. Uh, sorry for uh, the late uh, presentation. Uh, I am Yadavendra uh, from uh, I, uh, Indian Academy Degree College, Anandas. We are here to present the topic: courtship, courtship in Sorry Spring. Topic in itself describes the pure love between the mag magnificent Sorry Spring. The Sorry Spring. are easily distinguished from other pink in the in the region by its overall gray color and the contrasting red head and upper neck they forage on marshes and shallow wetlands for roots tubers insects crustaceans and small vertebrate prey like other pink they form long lasting pair bonds and maintain territories within which they perform territorial and courtship displays that include loud trumpeting leap and dance like movements In India, they are considered symbols of marital fertility, believed to mate for life and find the loss of their mates even to, even to the point of starving to death. The main breeding season is during the rainy season, when the pair builds an enormous nest island, a circular platform of reeds and grasses, to ne nearly two meters in diameter and high enough to stay above the shallow water surrounding it. Increased agricultural land. is often thought to have led to the decline in forest prey numbers but they also benefit from wetland crops and construction of canals and reservoirs the stronghold of the species in is in india where it is traditionally revered and lives in agricultural lands in close proximity to humans elsewhere the species is being 
extirpated in many parts of its former range. It is jacket mountain. One second. I think you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, under. Yes, sir. So the material, the content was conveyed. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. thank you, thank you, yeah, under. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Shubha and Dr. Baskaran for chairing this uh, last session of the Today yes. National thank Conference. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Sanjay, for you, giving me this opportunity. So I also and myself and. Uh, Co-chairperson, uh, covering with all the speakers who have presented in the info uh, process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank, you. Thank, you sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful uh, day is after the two days were for the national conference on recent trends in animal behavior, focal theme on human animal conflict, 44th annual conference DSI in association with St. Joseph's. Here it comes to an end, and uh, every good has to come to an end, and that's how this too uh, gets into that list of goodies. Uh, very informative uh, uh, session. Just to sum it up, what's going to follow up now is the valid uh, ceremony, where the formal vote of thanks will be rendered by the executive secretary, uh, Dr. K. R. Manjula. And then the national anthem will be played for a pay respect. Okay. Uh, before that, to sum it, we had uh, wonderful uh, sessions. And uh, though we missed on uh, Dr. Manjari Jain, all the other plenary sessions went on. It was all five plenary talks. One, we had two keynote. The first keynote was by Dr. DPS Verma, a former principal chief. Of Forest and Chief uh, Wildlife Warden Gujarat, sir, spoke on human wildlife conflict uh, with reference to the Asiatic lions. The second was on chronobiology by Dr. Atan Marpati, uh, again, uh, different dimension biological rhythms in street animals. Of the plenary, the first one was by Dr. H. Prayag, uh, whose title was on human animal interaction, then followed by uh, today's uh, plenary by Dr. T. N. Sivitya, who spoke on associations and organism among male Asian elephants. Uh, then it was lunch today, the plenary on insect behavior by Dr. M. G. Venkatesha. And then uh, Avinash came back from yesterday to today, and he spoke about uh, the developing resilient and managing human elephant conflict in multiple use landscapes. If you think I'm addressing him in uh, single, that's because he's an alumnus of St. Joseph's, my student, and now into being the director of Arusha. And the last uh, plenary was by uh, Mr. Gauri Shankar, uh, something innovative, new into this world of King Cobras, the intraspecific behavior of King Cobras. Informative, loaded with uh, knowledge for the participants who took part in this national conference. Uh, before the formal vote of thanks is rendered, I would like to place on record the gratitude to the management of St. Joseph's College, the principal, uh, Reverend uh, Father Dr. Victor Lobo SJ, our registrar, uh, Professor Melvin Colagasso, Dean, Dr. Beatrice uh, Sequeria, who Dr. Beatrice also rendered the presidential address during the inaugural ceremony. Uh, happy to know that Dr. Driti Banerjee was here, the first woman director of the Zoological Survey of India in 100 years, a celebrating moment and uh, wonderful keynote speakers. And thanks to all the chairpersons, Dr. Santosh Jagdeshan, Dr. Manjula, Dr. Raj Shikra, Dr. Aarti, Dr. Samson, Dr. Kavya, and Dr. Baskaran and Dr. Shubha for uh, coordinating and moderating all the sessions which were categorized. Which were categorized into three categories on uh, oral presentations, which were research and review based, and then uh, poster presentation, research and review based, and info poster presentation, a launch pad for undergraduate students who are not into hard research, but they can review 
important topics and present interesting facts of animal behavior uh, from the animal kingdom. So thank you for the participants uh, for that. Uh, as I noted uh, in the inaugural itself, that there are errors which will be rectified either sides and the final copy will be sent. If there are still more that you want to send in uh, of uh, the corrections, please do mail us on sjcnsa.gmail.com. And uh, I also like to place on record that this collaboration uh, it was possible thanks to Dr. Shakuntala Sridhara, the president of ESI. This is mainly the brainchild of uh, Dr. Shakuntala Sridhara and the massive support that came from Dr. Gita Bali and Dr. DPS Verma. <coughs> I thank all the executive members of the ESI to having explored, adventured into this uh, conference to be organized. First of its kind, as the president noted, between uh, ESI and a uh, aided and private college, St. Joseph's College Autonomous. And uh, another interesting, uh, another feather to this cap was the Memorandum of Understanding to be signed. First again, uh, with ESI tying up with any institution, this is landmark and we expect it will continue the legacy. <coughs> and, uh, I'm thankful to all my staff in the Department of Zoology. This conference happens to be something very, very memorable. Uh, though it was conceived, uh, the concept was uh, decided last month. By the time it was happening, I got appointed as the head of the Department of Zoology. So it was something uh, very, very uh, personally connecting to my career as well when I'm uh, here to enter the vote of thanks the inaugural ceremony and also to place that to here the formal vote of thanks to be delivered by Dr. Manjul. Uh, all my colleagues are supportive and without whose help this could not have happened. They also helped in chairing sessions and also uh, motivating students in uh, organizing this event. The whole lot of uh, thing happens be happened because of the Natural Science Association office bearers. And you saw all the students introducing and uh, uh, behind the screen uh, doing work along with Dr. Sampson in compiling the abstract book. And uh, specifically for this, we had uh, put Rebecca, Ishwan, Suvant, Nandita, and Maria as student coordinators. That's our tradition that we follow in St. Joseph's to seek uh, leaders. Allow students to come in the forefront and run the show and in organizing it. Uh, with that, uh, thanks. Over to Dr. Manjula for the formal vote of thanks. And then we have the national anthem, a mega diverse country, four biodiversity hotspots, 10 biogeographical zones. We celebrate biodiversity and animal behavior. So we'll stand for the national anthem after the formal vote of thanks. Abhishek will play. Over to Dr. Manjula. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Jaishankar. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose vote of thanks on this occasion. Let me first of all start by giving glory to the Almighty God for making the conference a resounding success. On behalf of Ethological Society of India, we are grateful to the organizing committee. Uh, Ma'am, your mic is on mute. Uh, Dr. Manjula, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. So let me first of all start by giving the glory to the Almighty God for making the conference a resounding success. On behalf of Ethological Society of India, we are grateful to the organizing committee of St. Joseph College, student, volunteer, principal, faculty, technical team. Uh, and also, I, a special thanks to Dr. M. Jayashankar, the man behind this successful conference on animal behavior. I would like to thank our president, Dr. Shakuntala Sridharama, for her continuous support, motivation, and also my heartfelt thanks to Gita Bali Ma'am and Verma Sir, and all the members of ESI and executive members for all their support and motivation. We owe a special gratitude to all the wonderful speakers, presenters, and the participants for making this conference a memorable one. 
thank you wish you all a merry christmas and a advanced happy new year thank you jay shankar thank you thank you uh, if there is anybody who wants to share a feedback they can shakuntala ma'am yes over to you Uh, Shaku, uh, are you muted? Shakuntala, I think you are on mute. No, no. no. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Echo. If you have two two devices, you can switch off one. No, I don't, I think, don't so. think so. so, so. Only one device I am using, but there is echo. Can I go ahead? Ma'am, uh, the echo is uh, having a very big ripple effect. Uh, quite big background. Yeah, meanwhile, I say a couple of words. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Jai Shankar and uh, your team uh, for the wonderful job. And I'm really very, very happy. I never realized that so many youngsters are working on in the field of beha behavior. It was really heartening. So uh, I was uh, wondering, all uh, everybody must have given up and uh, uh, taken up molecular biology. At the cellular level, nothing at the organism level. So, uh, ma'am, you're on mute. Uh, studies, uh, uh, behavioral studies are really extremely important and as well as uh, very interesting. We saw so many very interesting, highly interesting papers. And uh, many youngsters uh, taking up a very interesting work was very heartening. Um, so this is a, uh, your conference has uh, really reminded us once more how many people, uh, youngsters are uh, interested in animal behavior. So I wish to, on my behalf, I wish to thank Jai Shankar uh, for all the of, of your efforts. And uh, of course, uh, I part of us. So I thank you all, all the youngsters who worked for this conference. I wish to thank on my personal behalf. Thank you. 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 Thank you, ma thank you for those words of encouragement. Yeah. Shakuntala, ma'am, uh, you want to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Some uh, disturbance is there uh, to wind up. On behalf of the Ethological Society of India, my sincere and heartfelt thanks. Ma'am, how do you like uh, trying, leaving the meet and then rejoining? With the Herschel account, it was clear. Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am, it's clear. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, okay, no. this, this is a small bit of vote of thanks on my, from me to the organizers of the this wonderful conference. As Dr. Geeta Bali has said, we were thinking that zoology, all zoologists are going towards molecular biology, nanotechnology, and all that. But it is heartening to see that whole organisms are also a focus of interest and research for the youngsters, particularly youngsters. And looking at all those wonderful photographs, wonderful behavioral postures presented by the speakers, it is very heartening that ethology is kicking with the country. And I have seen ethological conferences in 1970s, and now it is 2020, and the growth is enormous. 
and uh, St. Joseph College has added one more significant step towards the march of ethology in the country. So thank you all. Thank you, Jay Shankar. Thank you, management of St. Joseph College. And I also thank all my executive committee members uh, for this uh, wonderful and successful conference. It is very memorable. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't see each other. Uh, that is a very big uh, missing link. Hope that uh, next year we can see each other and have a physical conference instead of a virtual. So I welcome you all for the 45th annual conference, which will coincide 50 years of uh, Ethological Society of India uh, and will become a celebration, golden jubilee celebration of the society. Uh, that is really singularly uh, achieved uh, uh, goal because the society lives only on membership fees. We don't have any other source of income. But still, ethologists all over the country are so enthusiastic. They have made the society grow by enrolling themselves and also conducting the national conference in the nooks and corner of the society. We have gone to west, we have gone to east, north and south. So that is a spectacular growth for a society uh, which has limited resources. Only the enthusiasm of the members has made this society this big and great. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. As you said, the last announcement, the full length papers that you're willing to submit, please do it by January 15th if you wish it get published in a book with ISBN number, as we are mentioned in the brochure. Any doubts regarding that, please feel, feel free to contact me or write uh, through the mail so that we can bring out the full length paper, the proceedings of this conference. I also forgot to mention Dr. Viola, my colleague who chaired one of the session. Thank you, Viola and all the other uh, members who were with us. Yes, this is another uh, feather that we did it online, a virtual conference. Uh, the pandemic sometimes uh, has flip side of goodness. We are videos of that. And let's hope that uh, this too shall pass and the normalcy will return back and humanity will cherish to live happily. The last thing, but uh, very important, paying respect to the diversity of this country and to our land, the national anthem. Uh, wherever you are, please stand up for the national anthem. I request Abhishek to play the national anthem. Abhishek. If he's not there, we can just sing. And there is some creativity, that's a reason. We'll wait and see.
Yes, with that, we come to the formal end of the two-day virtual conference on uh, trends in animal behavior with a focal theme on uh, human-wildlife conflict, 44th annual by Ethological Society of India, organized in association with the Natural Science Association, Department of Zoology, St. Joseph's College. Thank you all. Thank you to the seniors and elders who have motivated us, guide us. We will pass that baton. We will carry it further into future and motivate the next line of generation. Thank you all. Good evening. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good evening to all. Thank you all. The feedback form will be posted in the chat box. Please don't uh, fail in uh, not filling it. Please fill the feedback forms. Or we'll post it to them on the WhatsApp group. Uh, do consider them there. attendance form i believe we'll post it uh, shortly here or else on to the whatsapp group please stick on to the whatsapp group The feedback attendance forms are posted uh, in the WhatsApp group that you're all there. Please uh, fill it there. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.